I went to the only son. Pam and Sarah. with the military and went to college on the GI and did like film. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. How much do we find here? Place for lunch. <laughs> I came for
2023 Board of County Commissioners to order. Um, since Chairman Paisley is not here, I'll go ahead and open with the uh, invocation. Please join me in prayer. Father God, we thank you so much, dear Lord, for blessing, the blessing of life, blessing of your mercy and your grace, blessing of wisdom and courage and knowledge, dear Lord. We ask you to watch over us, protect us, guide the direction, to guide and direct the actions of the Board of Commissioners for the benefit of the citizens of Alamance County. And we ask these things, dear Lord, in the powerful and holy name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Join me with the pledge. Pledge to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Make a motion we approve the agenda. Second. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. It's been an interesting morning already. <laughs> Let me announce in advance, three minutes only, there will be a buzzer. And uh, because we have so many people that have already signed up, uh, three minutes will, be, will mean three minutes. And I will gavel you down if you go beyond that. Um, so be courteous to everybody. Additionally, our procedure states that we have a total of 30 minutes for all speakers. So if you have more than three for one topic, uh, if that's the case, then I can take a five minute break, let you guys get your uh, positions together and allow three speakers per topic. Do we need to take a five minute recess? Just look at, I'm looking at heads. If you have more than three talking on one topic, You do have? All right, we're gonna take a five minute break. You guys discuss it. You can have three speakers per side of a topic. We're in a five minute break. Mr. Chair, I, I think the rule now says that we have a total of 30 minutes regardless of the number of speakers on a topic. Okay, has it yeah. cha it's changed? I, I think that changed last year. That's okay. right. Then we don't need to do that. I'm just gonna call them in the order that they're on my list. Okay, Richard Clark. And by the way, the three minutes does not start if you're handing materials and they do it very quickly. <laughs> so it'll start when you start speaking. Thank you. You can, speakers that have materials, you can hand them to the clerk. Raise your hand, please, ma'am. 
and she will hand them out to us if you'd like. Okay, uh, I'm sorry I did that wrong. No, no, you didn't. I did I not announce it. Okay, <laughs> all right. That's okay. fine. Okay, proceed, please, sir. Okay. Uh, state your name, everybody state your name and address. My name is Richard Clark. Uh, I live in Burlington on Westover Terrace. Uh, is that mic on, Bruce? Yeah, it's, it's on. Here. It's definitely on. Uh, it's on. The issue I'm talking about here is noise related to the gun range, that's all. Uh, I want to make several points. Uh, the number that I ask you to jot down there is already <laughs> in this. It's a it's a patent that I share jointly with several people. I originated the basic idea. The patent describes a method of testing hearing with a digital source, such as a CD or a digital signal, transmitted on the Internet. Two of the people listed are Dr. Charles Watson and Diane Coleyport. Uh, Watson is a highly regarded doctor on the subject of speech and hearing. Diane is Professor Emeritus of Speech, Language, and Hearing Sciences at Indiana University. In 2020, she was president of the Acoustical Society of America. To validate this patent, large numbers of students at the university were tested with this method and it scored favorably compared to very costly medical equipment. Measuring sound accurately is not as simple as buying a consumer grade SPL meter. Professional grade equipment such as a calibrated microphone, a microphone calibrator, and some method of recording the results are basic necessities. I have given you pictures of some very expensive sound measuring equipment uh, on the last page of this handout. Sound, like many things we care to measure, requires a minimum, a good understanding of the nature of sound. Anyone intending to study something as complex as sound should at least own two universally acclaimed books, one of which I raise here. This is the absolute Bible of audio. Uh, it came from MIT. It's been a standard in the industry for 60 years. These two books are the Bible. I want to point out that I own the property that borders on and is closest to the range. I have rarely measured sound exceeding 75 dBA slow scale. Uh, government standards say that eight hours of continuous exposure should be limited to 85 dBA slow scale. Sir Isaac Newton gave, uh, gave us a natural law called the inverse square law. It applies to light, gravity, sound, and a myriad of things related to energy, this law tells that a doubling of distance, energy falls off by the square. In other words, if a sound travels 50 feet and is 80 dB, when it continues and travels 100 feet, it will drop another 60 dB, and so on. Based on measurements at my shop being the closest to the range, I cannot see how any dangerous sound levers could occur at any of the other properties on Fawcett Lane. Let's assume that we do get a reading of 85 dB somewhere because someone fires a large caliber gun. Let's make the math simple and say the gunshot lasts for one second. In order for the noise to last an hour, the gunfire would have to be continuous. There are 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in an hour. 60 times 60 equals 3,600. These days, a typical large car caliber round costs about 50 cents. That's $1,800 times eight hours to produce the 85 dB limit for one hour. That's $14,000. I'll have to catch you all. Is that the three you. minutes? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got you got the important notes, okay? Yes. Never sure mind. Thank you. Okay, Rudolph Catasi Catas. Pronounce your name, Rudolph. Catasi. Catasi. Two, three, four, five. Okay. Catasi. My name is uh, Ralph Hercast. I live at 207 East Dillard Street, Medford, North Carolina. My business is Rad Range Rad Industries at 1746 Jim Barnwell Road. Good morning. Deja vu. Uh, I was staying here last year around the same time. I only have three minutes. The pack has more information I can go over in that time. Last meeting, there was a couple individuals that made some false statements. Too many to list in three minutes. 
Red Range took over for 1776 Shooting Club. Since last year, nothing has changed. We pay our taxes, we have our SOTs, our FFLs, nothing's changed. What has happened recently is we done maintenance on the berms. All Rad Ranger's berms are now bermed all around with a 20 degree down angle, as you can see in your packet. So that means the shooter is shooting down 20 degrees. You can't go any lower. Uh, the berms are taller. We use steel targets. We have bermed up as required by law. Rad Ranger is the only range that is staffed. That means we have RSOs on hand. As you see in your packet, also we have first aid kits. Those first aid kits are designed, the red parts, and for blood loss. You can ask any EMT, we have all the stuff in there. Tourniquets, uh, you know, skin clamps, the whole nine yards. If something does happen, we are safe. As you see, we already have rules on the range. Red Range does not do trap or skeet shooting because of lead shot. Lead hits the ground, water runs on it, sunlight hits it, and that produces lead oxide. That's the health issue. That's why we don't do that. Next is the ordinance that's going to be presented today from the county attorney. The county attorney is not an expert on firearms as range in information as far as I know, nor does he hold the green firearms. I'm a certified RA instructor, North Carolina State uh, certified instructor, teach concealed carry. I have two FFLs, type sevens for manufacturing and SOTs. I've been around firearms most of my life, plus other certifications. Section two of this ordinance is completely wrong. Firearm is determined by either GCA, which is Gun Control Act of America, or the NFA. Both are legal. Suppressors, short barrel rifles, short barrel shotguns, even machine guns and structure are illegal. They're just heavily restricted. So I don't know where the firearm, they're saying skeet shoot it. Firearm is a term firearm. Section four, he is, as the county attorney wrote, is what he did, meaning showing reckless care or attention, infringing on the public right to keep and bear arms under both the GCA and the NFA. Section five, six, and seven target my business, Rad Range specifically. Even Ray Charles, who's blind, could see this. Let me show you how easy it is for me to get past this. I print the ordinance out and post it up like I did here. Okay, I'm compliant with the ordinance. I'm not willfully doing anything wrong. If the county wants to sit a deputy at rad range, that's fine with me. With CSI, so when a bullet does leave the range, if it does and hits a tree, they can extract the bullet and then get that person and charge them $500. There's also information there, like I said, we, you know, that's 77 days a week. That's why we have the 1910 Range Protection Act. It protects me from this exact thing with new ordinance being passed against me. Also, ex pro facto. See information on done, trespassing, we have night cameras, vision, thermals. We see everything that goes on at Rad Range, including where the bullets go. Rad Range is safe. It's working. Elements County is safer with all the training we do for this county. You want my property, you can't have my business. It's not for sale. I ran out of time, but that's about it. To world peace. To, to both you and Mr. Clark, we have your materials and we will review them. Okay, Butch McKenzie. Everybody has materials. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <coughs> My name is Butch McKenzie. I live at um, 2750 White Swan Drive. I'm not going to talk to you about this being in a watershed, the Rad Range, that is, and how its long term effects on the environment, like what's going on at the Wilmington Gun Range on military cutoff, where they have spent millions of dollars trying to clean up four acres of lead. I'm not going to talk to you about the noise on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock like just as pat like yesterday when the Deep Creek Baptist Church is trying to have a Sunday church service. They try to have weddings. They try to have funerals all interrupted by gunfire. What I am going to tell you about is the two fence workers on Mr. Dunn's property which is posted with no hunting signs and they have gunfire going by their head, bullets going by their head. A fisherman at a pond on Jim Barnwell Road, he has to take cover for bullets going by him. And Mr. Brooks, while checking his mailbox on Jim Barnwell Road, and bullets going by him. Uh, this year, on March the 5th, Dwayne Allred, he had bullets going by him. He called the Sheriff's Department, and Deputy Mel Gayreith responded to the call, and at least eight bullets went by her. How many chances are we going to give the gun range before someone gets shot? This is not just about the range being unsafe, it's about the brazen attitude of the owners. They rip down our signs, they remove our no trespassing signs, they say that uh, surveys are wrong, they say the birds are louder than gunfire, and they say that Mr. Dunn and I trespass on their property. 
all untrue. We're not against gun ranges. We're not against guns. We've got the Alamance County Wildlife Club. We've got the Central Carolina Gun Club, a half mile and a half down the road. These are safe gun ranges. This range has only got 23.5 acres, as you can see on that sheet I hand out, according to the deed of trust. It's bordered on two sides by Jim Barnwell Road and Fawcett Lane. It's bordered on the backside by other properties. The bullets they shoot go on to Mr. Dunn's property, they go on Mrs. Talley's property, they go on Betty Carroll's property. No berm in the world is going to keep these bullets from going on other people's properties. They would have to be 200 feet tall. It's impossible. This, all, this nightmare started when Chris Powell started the 1776 Sporting Club two years ago. September 20th of 21, as you can see on that sheet, is when they put it in the Rad Ranges LLC. They started this mess, and they're trying to keep it going. They've changed the gun range since they took over. They've started moving their um, targets around and stuff because they don't have the land they thought they had because they had been trespassing on Howard Dunn's property. Why didn't they get a survey when they purchased it? Did they get title insurance? I mean, these are things you do when you buy real estate. That's all I got to say. Thanks. Gary Garrison. Garrison. My name is uh, Gary Garrison. I live at 2464 Fawcett Lane in Burlington. Hand those out. People say that I live in the country. Well, no, I live in a rural community with multiple churches, businesses, homes, and housing developments. I just want to say that I don't think a, a, a gun range should be allowed to serve alcohol on its property. Um, I don't think a gun range should be allowed to have projectiles <laughs> land on other owners' property. As you can see in those pictures, that's uh, trees from Mr. Howard Dunn's property. <coughs> uh, um, I have been served a cocktail at Rad Range, so I know that they really do serve whiskey. No, you don't. Well, you do, because I had a cocktail there. Yes, I did. And, and that's proof that the bullets go on other people's property. All right, so, I'm going to stop you right there. Yes. Uh, two minutes and one second. Bruce, I don't know whether you can extend this or not, but we will not have people in the audience interrupting the speaker. Can you reset the clock while you have the clock? The audience. I'm about over. Uh, no, no, no. Chair. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the audience. Yes, okay. And I'm sorry. saying there will be no more interference or speaking out of turn. Okay. Uh, I'm going to. We stopped at 201. I'm going to count you five extra seconds plus what we've got on the clock. Okay, All right? thanks. So go. Okay. All I've got to say <laughs> sooner or later, an individual, a vehicle, or a home could be shot. And I find the fate of these future victims lie in you guys' hands. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Okay, Jason Apopa. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Is, Is anybody in there in the other room? Oh, they could be. No, there's not. Is not. Work on. No. Next speaker is. Gary Dwayne Albright. Good morning. My name is Gary Dwayne Albright. I live at 2302 Cooper Road, Grand North Carolina. My aunt Cornelia Talley lives at 2627 Fawcett Lane. I'm going to speak plainly and clearly. I hunt and fish on my aunt's property. I cannot take my children to this property anymore because it is unsafe. Rounds have come over to my aunt's property. I have feared for my life. Over the past two years, well, since 
November of 21, I've been in contact with the previous owner, David Simmons, by text message asking him that, and telling him that there are rounds coming over. This past January, I talked to him, and he said he is no longer in ownership of the range. On March 5th, I called the Sheriff's Department because I was out at the deer feeder, checking my deer feeder, checking my cameras, and there were rounds continually coming over my head. I called the Sheriff's Department. The deputy come out, we all, and another friend of mine, Bruce Ayers, was with, was with me. We all hit the deck, was trying to stay safe. The officer went over to the range, whatever happened over there was between her and the range. All I'm asking for is the range to come up tremendously with their safety protocols. There's been multiple times that I've been on my aunt's property and I have to put my head behind a tree hoping not to get shot. I know most time I hunt in the morning, but in the afternoon is also another time to hunt. Mm -hmm. And I'm asking the range to come. I don't know what safety protocols they have made to improve the range or not. I'm asking for some help. I'm asking for this board to help me, help the community, make it safe. For me, my children, whether I'm mowing my aunt's property on the tractor, if she's walking on her own property that backs up to the back of the range, make it safe. Thank you. And we thank you, sir. Okay, Kent Thompson. Good morning. My name is Kenneth Thompson. I live at 2532 Fawcett Lane. It's directly across the street from Rad Range. And in purchasing this home about a year ago, one of the factors that led me to choose this particular property was its proximity to the range. I'm an advocate for our Second Amendment rights. I'm an advocate for Rad Range. And um, as a member, I can tell you that they continuously work on their safety protocol. Um, just this morning, they had a bulldozer removed from the site because they were increasing the size of the berms. Um, I have multiple friends that use the range on a regular basis and I don't need to take up any more time than to just say that from this neighbor's perspective, um, the one thing I've heard this morning is the safety protocol. I think it's something to look into further and continually improve upon, but I'm an advocate for the range. Thank you. And thank you, sir. Okay, Brian Compton. Good morning. My name is Brian Compton. I live at 3437 North NC Highway 62 in uh, Burlington. Um, I'm a, basically pretty close to where the, the range is. Um, I would say that the range is not uh, the only uh, place where guns are um, fired around there. So um, I have other neighbors that shoot um, quite consistently um, and they don't use the even the same safety protocols that I've seen at, at the range. Yes, there are berms there at the range. Um, some are actually fairly high um, and would catch the bullets. Um, I've, I'm a retired uh, California Highway Patrol officer. So I've been around guns for you know, 25, 30 years um, uh, using it for law enforcement. I have been shot at um, in the course of my duties. Um, and if you, if you talk to people in the military, they know what it is to be shot at because they know exactly what the sound of the bullet passing by their head is. Um, I've not heard anything like that being anywhere around the property on Rad Range. Um, as far as noise goes, I hear the range, but it, it doesn't exceed uh, generally what I hear from my neighbors. Uh, you know, a little two-stroke motorcycle going up and down the street is noisier than the range is. The, the party that lives close to, to me, their radio is louder than the range is. So the noise isn't an issue. Um, 
if you wish to uh, continue working on the, the safety protocols, hey, I, I think everybody's for that. I think Rudy would be uh, for that as well. Um, we can always uh, in work to improve on that stuff. But I don't see how bullets are going by people's heads um, because things are being shot into a berm on a consistent basis. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Amy, thank, thank you. you. Dale Russell. Another man with a hand out. <laughs> this is just one thing. I get laser. Well, good morning. I'm Darrell Russell. I live at 1526 McCray Road, Burlington. That's in the northern part of the county. I'm here to voice my support and thank you for considering the proposed ordinance regulating the discharge of firearms later in the meeting. Thank you. It's a good start in addressing safety issues with some outside shooting ranges. But I'm also asking that the county adopt a separate outside shooting range ordinance to help curtail excessive noise and other issues from about all outside shooting ranges. I'm just not talking about one. I've always been told that a picture is worth a thousand words. And I passed out a little map that shows a zone of noise influence from just two shooting ranges in the northern part of the county. And I live midway between both of them. So on uh, just about every day, I get excess noise, depending on when. Now this zone is based on a two mile radius from each shooting range. <coughs> and that two miles is what a shooting range designer told me was a zone of influence. That's not you. <laughs> Thank you. Now please note that just that zone is 17, 000, about 19,000 acres. And that's 7% of the county's total area. There are other shooting ranges in other parts of the county that have similar impacts. So you can see that shooting ranges affect a significant portion of the county and thousands of residents. You know, we're no longer a rural county. We got new developments going up everywhere. And a new shooting range could come in anywhere out in the county. We have no rules, no laws, nothing that would prevent them from going. I don't know where y'all live, but if you're out in the county, it could come right beside of you. The residents in all of these zones need protection and they need your help. Uh, other counties have outside shooting range ordinances, rural counties. So this is not something new. Uh, there wouldn't be any legal precedence, I don't believe, for this. And it would significantly help protect all of the residents that are in close proximity to shooting ranges. Thank you. And thank you. Beth, is it Kennett? Kennett. Like Bennett, but with a K. <laughs> thank you. How many times do you have to say that? <laughs> Every time. <laughs> I understand that totally. <laughs> <laughs> Every time. My name is Beth Kennett, and I live at 324 West Willowbrook Drive in Burlington. Good morning, County Commissioners. I'm not going to talk to you about shooting. I, I know little about it. Um, but I do stand before you this morning um, wavering between deep sadness and feeling a little bit, uh, let me just say, utterly appalled um, at the consideration of our county to reallocate money from Alamance Burlington School System to um, make improvements with the courthouse or, or anywhere else for that matter. I don't spend a lot of time in the courthouse or jail, yet I can imagine there are improvements, regular maintenance and updates that probably need to be made. But taking money that can be used to further education in this county should not even be considered. I did read in the plans of the courthouse improvements, um, and I have a, a snippet from your, the plan in front of me, um, that 
the courthouse improvements would include additional courtrooms for former administrative and office space, improvements to jury and bailiff rooms, connection to courthouse services and administrative offices, safe access from detention center to courtrooms, bathroom accessibility improvements, public parking adjacent to public court entry. In the ABSS improvements, too many pages for me to copy and paste into three minutes. Um, however, what we see in that list are projects of adding facilities and classrooms, but mostly we see needed repair of things that, are, that will help us to function safely like floors and roofs. Each list of school improvements contains necessary changes for school facilities to continue to be used. County commissioners, I ask you to be responsible to our community, to our students, to our teachers and staff. Education should always be a priority. And until all public school facilities are working and functioning properly and all school staff are making a reasonable wage, this board of commissioners should never consider taking any funds that can be allocated to the Alamance Burlington School System for use in any other place. So I thank you. I do notice that this is coming up, or a, a proposed capital improvement, I'm hoping that's a revision, is coming to you later in this meeting. So I am asking that you consider reallocating to Alamance Burlington School System. Thank you. Thank you. We made it within the 30 minutes. Thank all the speakers. Uh, that is the last speaker. The county commissioners have county commissioner comments at the end of the meeting. We are not at this point able to address the concerns of the speakers, things of that sort, but we certainly can do that at the end of the meeting. So if you all get up and leave now, that's great, but you won't hear our comments at the end of the meeting. Okay. We now have the consent agenda. Motion to approve. So, uh, second. Any comments? Motion to approve and seconds. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Okay, is Ms. Allison going to present this? Good morning. Good morning, Chair Paisley and um, commissioners. I'm Linda Allison. I work with the Alamance County, um, excuse me, Sheriff's Office. Um, and I was asked to come this morning and share a very brief update with you about some work of a subcommittee that is an extension of the Justice Advisory Council. Um, this is a subcommittee that is in place to address um, some concerns with regard to licensed facilities that would be group homes adult care homes um, family care homes in the county um, uh, back in 2019 the justice advisory council had heard from lots of different members and um, providers within the county about some issues associated with um, licensed facilities and um, what is unique about alamance county is many people don't know the number of facilities the sheer number that we have in this county um, so I'll let you know that with regard to mental health group homes, we have 77 licensed adult care homes. We have 19 licensed adult care homes. Those are greater than six beds, the ones that are monitored by DSS. We have 32 family care homes. They have less than six beds um, and also monitored by DSS for a total of 128 licensed facilities. As you know, as it's obvious with the name of the facilities, mental health group homes do provide care to persons with mental illness um, as their primary diagnosis. The um, adult care homes and family care homes can also care for individuals with mental illness. Um, ordinarily, it's not their primary diagnosis, but as we know, many, many with mental illness do reside in these homes. Um, a task force, as I said, back in 2019 was put in place by the Justice Advisory Council just to study, evaluate, gather data, and look at this issue. We were hearing from law enforcement regarding the numbers of 911 calls and mental health crisis calls they were responding to in these facilities. We also were hearing from the magistrate's office, even from the courts, emergency room staff with regard to issues surrounding uh, residents in the group homes. Um, 
being um, in response to mental health crisis calls. So this committee met about five times, the ad hoc task force, um, over the course of 2019, early 2020. Um, the pandemic hit, um, so they were not meeting in person, but we were still gathering information from law enforcement across the county and various people. And this, a summary report of recommendations came out um, from this task force with just four um, recommendations. And um, the, the recommendations were to evaluate a per county moratorium on group homes or adult care homes, if that was a possibility. Also to require annual education training for all staff within these facilities on mental illness. Third was to place additional requirements on group home facilities to match the staff credentials and abilities with the needs or diagnoses of the residents. And lastly, to provide additional interventions and oversight for mental health group homes and facilities who consistently require law enforcement and or um, other emergency responses for or serious violations over a specific threshold. So the subcommittee that I'm talking to you about today um, was put in place as a follow-up to the larger task force to see if we could um, work to develop strategies and implement solutions from these four recommendations of the task force. So this committee has been meeting since 2022. The partners are Department of Social Services, our mobile crisis responder who is Freedom House Recovery. We also have an RHA staff person. We have someone from Via Health. We have um, re consistent participation with someone from Division of Health Service Regulation in Raleigh, which is a pretty big deal. Um, we also have a law enforcement represented and a few others. Um, so primarily, there is very little that we can do around um, local ordinances, perhaps, um, or county moratoriums. You know, if you're in a municipality like Burlington um, or one of the municipalities, there may be certainly more that can be done. But the work that we have done is to concentrate on that fourth recommendation, which, which was to provide additional interventions and oversight for these facilities. So what came out of this group was um, that certain specific facilities, and let me be clear, the majority of these licensed facilities do a magnificent job. They provide quality care to their residents. Um, so we're talking about probably a small number of um, facilities who over and over call perhaps 911. We're not talking about when there's truly an emergency or some violent, um, you know, incident has taken place. We're talking about in response to a mental health crisis. So as you know, in our county, there are lots of resources for that. There is a crisis center that they can take individuals to um, that operates from 8 a.m. to midnight. There are other mental health providers in the county. We also have a mobile crisis provider, which is Freedom House Recovery out of Chapel Hill. Um, and they um, come out whenever they are called, usually within 30 minutes to an hour. We also um, have, of course, ARMC, it, it just lots of individuals um, and, and helplines that they can call. So the strategy was to take um, refer referrals from, um, again, the magistrate's office, law enforcement, when they were working over and over and seeing certain facilities come in, wanting to take out IVC paperwork when it wasn't meeting the criteria, or they would come in wanting to have charges pressed resident, you know, on a resident, that type thing, when it was not legitimately. So, so we thought, well, you know, um, if we can share more resources with them and help them know what exists, maybe it will eliminate some of the overuse of public resources of our law enforcement. So we um, worked with Via Health to get um, a resource sheet put together of all the resources. We had it printed in um, colored cardstock paper, um, neon color, and we also had um, a resource sheet put together by Via Health that um, gives de-escalation tips that they could use when they have such an incident. So we have worked um, with our mobile crisis provider um, to take this short list um, of, of facilities that were referred and reach out to them um, and have the mobile crisis, crisis provider reach out to say, um, would you be willing for us to come into your facility and or to sit down with you to talk about local resources, how to de-escalate, that type thing. Um, it's all voluntary, which means there's not a lot of teeth in that. And as you can imagine, we didn't get a huge response from this short list of individuals. Um, but that's okay. Um, they continue to provide that resource. 
Um, another thing we've done is to work with CECOM and county GIS to better track 911 calls that are specific to mental health crisis. Um, and I'm really proud to say that um, they both have worked hard and I think we finally have a system whereby we'll be able to better track this. So hopefully the next time or any additional information we provide to you will be more specific with data related to those calls. Um, this committee has also worked to educate community providers on what's being done and how to refer if they have someone. The school system has had lots of issues around group homes. Um, as you know, um, with that many licensed mental health group homes, 77, 11 of which are youth facilities, the, gr the school system deals with this problem a lot, whereas children from other counties will be placed in group homes here. Um, so they don't have the sometimes responsible guardian or person to deal with. They're dealing strictly with the group home and that can present its own challenges. So we just want to let them know that if they have a facility they're concerned about, they can refer it and we'll link them up with a mobile crisis provider to do that outreach and education. We also um, are working with DSS. They're distributing these sheets in person as they do their um, every other month visit into the adult care homes and family care homes, talking one-on-one -on -one with them about mental health resources and how to navigate the system um, when they have crisis responses that should not be 911. Um, and I think, yeah, then we're also working with DHSR um, and Via Health and others um, on, on what else could be done. So our ask of you today simply is to understand the issue and know that simply because of the number of large number of facilities we have with a few number who may be, as I said, reoccurring um, issues <coughs> in dealing with the residents in their facility, um, that there are challenges. Um, there is certainly a potential that lots more challenges can occur with this number of facilities. Also to support the current work that's underway, if you could um, support the work and to assist us in engaging our legislators and state officials to drive the licensing requirement because the training requirement is set by the state in the licensure requirements for these facilities as far as how much mental health training, if any, that is required for them to work in a facility and that type thing. Um, we did send that summary report back in 2021 to um, our elected officials and um, several of them know of the work that we are doing, as do several of you. Um, and the last thing is to help us evaluate what, if anything, else can be done locally to improve the situation. I know that um, uh, Burlington Police Department, the City of Burlington has looked at possibly having, they have a draft letter that has not been approved yet, but that, that, you know, after reaching out to facilities or after X number of calls, they could send a letter to say, just want to let you know, you know, we've received this many calls within this, this year. Um, we would like to offer you these additional resources and or um, work with you. Um, and then if there is failure to, to work with them, perhaps then, you know, they might, of course, have no other choice than to contact the state or to contact the contractor, which is usually the local um, LME MCO um, in this county. That's typically via, but not always. Sometimes there are other LME MCOs that have contracted for, in this county. So anyway, we're just wanting to evaluate what, if anything else, can be done locally. Um, if to help us mitigate this this situation um, I have given you a very quick and brief update on that but um, I just wanted to let you know of that work and um, if you have any questions you can certainly contact me and we will if you'll just hang on our county attorney has um, at the request of our county manager and myself researched what we as a county can do you want to speak next um, sure. I guess I want to hear from the board, though, first, kind of what questions are, are remaining after the presentation, and thank you for that, um, as to what our involvement can and should be. Uh, I know the county has a limited role, and I appreciate all that you've presented today. I want to hear questions first, and I can maybe chime in afterwards. Okay, right. thank you. Ms. Thompson, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, I asked Linda to make this presentation because I'm on this task force. And um, I know we're number three in the state behind Wake and Buncombe. That says a lot. Uh, we seem to be here. It's just amazing what we are going to be known for. 
Um, being on the school board for eight years, I'm aware of young people that are transferred here from Charlotte Mecklenburg and all kind of other counties that are being put into a group home due to lack of availability and they're here in Elements County and that means they go to our school, they go through Ray Street and um, no matter what you think about group homes, which they're in boarding houses. <laughs> Um, they're good ones and they're not just like they're a good this and good that and not so to speak but um, I, I want us to understand that um, a lot of these kids didn't wake up and decide that they're just going to turn bad they've had a lot to happen to them <coughs> and our environment has a major effect on our outcomes when we start to make decisions um, and I know um, how I would be if I was um, a young teenager and um, my home was broken and I'm thrown out of it I'm in the juvenile court system and I moved not just out of my home but out of my county but out of my my whole city and everything else and to a brand new school I mean moving schools even if it's across town is a big adjustment um, Ray Street I, I just cannot say enough good things about Ray Street they know how to really treat young people and, and keep them safe and them feel that way but um, <coughs> 128 is a whole lot and we seem to get a whole lot of people from other counties and the point is to take <coughs> care of these young people because of what they're facing um, we've had some really traumatic situations to happen with young people in our schools or in their neighborhoods or whatever and we just can't ignore that and I really appreciate Linda talking about this because we've had reports of abuse to come out of some of these homes um, that comes out of some regular homes, let, let alone that, but um, young people are really battling some things. We're seeing the outcomes of them in our media, and we got to do better. And um, this job, working in a group home, you, you don't make a whole lot of money, and, um, and it's calling, just like a teacher is, social worker, pastor, soldier, you know, law enforcement. It's a real calling to work with this population because um, they got some serious issues going on. These, these kids don't trust anybody because they have been really had a number done on them for some things so um, you know I don't know what the answer is but I mean 128 and we're Alamance County and we're behind Wake County our capital and Buncombe the capital in the mountains so to speak I want us to really think about that I don't know what we can do about that the point and the main goal is children are cared for and they're safe and they're getting their education but it's just an accountability thing I just want to make sure I mean I, I just tell you this you are living in neighborhoods and you don't even realize what your neighborhood is. Just to shock and all, check your sex offender <laughs> registry. See all the little red balloons everywhere you think, oh my gosh, I mean, it's just what it is. So um, I just want us to really not push this to the side because Burlington PD is wore out with going to certain homes where kids are running, you know, because they're just emotional, they're a hot mess, and that's because they've come from a hot mess. And so we need to first have some understanding, compassion, but in the same sense, big time accountability. But these can be real money pits where a lot of people can just pop them up and make money with that. And I don't want people making money off broken lives. I, I just don't. And so um, that's, it's, you hear a lot when you sit on these task force from police. I mean, they know the same ones they're going to. And if you can't handle it, you don't need to be in the business because this is tough work. Mr. Lasher. Uh, just first of all, thank you for your presentation today. Um, and I would like to, um, you know, going forward, you know, like you said, to better understand the issues going forward and how we can help you sort of reach out to these uh, North Carolina House and Senate representatives. Mm -hmm. uh, if you could sort of direct us how you would like us to uh, engage those folks, because I sort of think what you just said, that the county, as far as this is concerned, does have a limited role, mm -hmm. but we can take some direction for sure. you, from you, and how we could engage our representatives to sort of help you out. Absolutely. Well, the subcommittee will have another meeting um, the last week of April, and so we'll do specifically that. Maybe we'll um, reach back. The, the legislators have been very responsive when we have reached out to them, and so maybe we can just let you know what our recommendations okay. would be as far as them pursuing additional licensure requirements with regard to training and or you know, matching up staff credentialing with um, the level of care needed, which would address a lot of this. So okay. I will be glad to do that. Great, thank you. Mr. Turner. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Ms. Allison. Uh, just a couple of quick questions. How many how many group homes are in Alamance County, but outside the municipalities? Do we have that number? Um, 
I can tell you that um, the majority are in the city of Burlington. I don't believe I have the exact um, breakdown, or maybe that I do. Um, I have. I know that in 2022, um, just talking about mental health group homes, not adult care or family care, I know that Burlington responded to 206, um, and that, as I said, doesn't include um, 206 calls. I will be happy to get that number. Um, I, I know that the county has their fair share of family care homes um, and adult care homes, but I do believe that almost almost all um, of the youth facilities, which there are 11 of those mental health homes, are in Burlington with only a few in the county. But um, there are lots of other facilities that are in the county, and I'll be happy to get that breakdown. I have the full list. You can go to the um, Division of Health Service Regulation and print the um, list. They, there are three different lists. One's adult care, one's family care homes, and one is mental health licensed group homes. But I will certainly send that breakdown of county versus municipalities okay. to you. That'd be helpful, I think. Sure. And, and the second thing is, uh, apart from us reaching out to our, our state delegation, what, what is your ask here today? What specifically would you like us to do? Um, I was asked to come and just make you aware um, of, of the, the issues, um, again, as I said. Um, but my ask would be that um, you do help us evaluate what, if anything, locally this board can do um, in the county to help us um, have more teeth in the situation when there are, uh, there are very few, but when there are these facilities that chronically perhaps um, overuse or misuse, I hate, to be, I'm very careful to say misuse because if it's a true 911 emergency, we're gonna be, uh, you know, honest, they need to call 911. But if it's something regarding um, a, a mental health crisis that otherwise could have been de-escalated by another resource within the county, then it should be the expectation of this board and all of our citizens that they not overuse the 911 system and the public resources. So I would ask you to help us evaluate if there is something, um, you know, like a letter that could be sent from, from the county, um, or um, certainly I think some of the municipalities are looking into that too, some of the higher utilizers of resources to say, we think there's a better way. Um, and then, as we said, reaching out to our legislators because it would take a county stepping forward to say, you need to make changes in the licensure rules. Um, we recommend that, that there be more training. To my knowledge, uh, to my knowledge, because I ask um, our representative with Division of Health Source Regulation, to my knowledge, the mental health licensed group homes are not even required to take mental health first aid, which is an eight hour course. Um, now there is a specific qualification for the mental health licensed homes where they have to have a uh, contract with and our staff who are qualified professionals, so let me be clear, they are qualified or have access to qualified persons, but the actual staff working in the facility may or may not have a significant level of training in mental illness, particularly in the family cares and adult care homes. Um, so those are my ask. <coughs> Thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't catch the number. Or I'm not sure you stated a number for those that are operating outside of the municipalities in the county. I said I would have to get that number okay. and break it down. This list has just addresses on it, so I don't know. It's not broken down by municipalities or counties, but I'll be happy to get that okay. information and Thank send you. it to um, Chairman Paisley. One of the things I've learned by serving on this board is that Alamance County has a tendency to really step up and try to take care of issues like this. Part of the reason we've probably got as many agents or many operations in the county as we have um, one of the things I've also learned is that in some cases we provide services to people from outside the county because other counties that surround us don't offer services. That's correct. So I'm curious to see, how, is there any sort of uh, accumulation or assimilation of data that show how many of the people that are being served in Alamance County are from Alamance County and how many are from other counties around the state? or even out of the state? I don't know how you would get that breakdown. Um, if they're receiving Medicaid, it might be possible to get something like that from social services or somebody. Um, but aside from calling each individual facility to say what county are your residents from, 
I, I'm not aware of how right. we would do that, but we do know what you said, in fact, is true. There are counties in this state who have no licensed facility, zero. Um, and, and for us to have, um, as Commissioner Thompson said um, at one time, uh, just a couple years ago, and it's probably still the same, I'm not sure, we were third with regard to the number of licensed adult care home and family care. I'm not sure where we are with mental health group homes, but we're high up on that list according to DHSR. Division of Health Service Regulation. And as you said, it does take um, sometimes counties stepping out and Alamance is one to step out and ask questions. And our representative who participates in the meetings from DHSR told us, he said, a lot of counties are, are struggling with these issues, but as far as I know, you're, you're maybe the only one who is actually uh, trying to address it. And I would, I guess this would be a question for our attorney, how much control do we have over operations within a municipality if any yeah so like we talked about a minute ago um, the county has a limited role in terms of governing or overseeing group home operation uh, pretty much what's delegated to social services in terms of their oversight is all the county really has in that role uh, most of this is done at the state level but mr. Turner your question about what the ask was is actually really helpful to me um, if we need to do some research as to what level of uh, change could be made related to how group homes are authorized to use our emergency services, that might be something we can research and try to present a proposal on. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank I you. appreciate that. Do we get, I'll ask this of the sheriff, and you may know the answer to this question, do we get a lot of calls for the sheriff's office or is it mostly calls within the various municipal police agencies? We get, we, get calls. we get a good number. Um, I know a year or more ago, um, our mental health licensed, um, our, our, our mental health response officers, they were getting quite a few calls to one specific facility. What would happen is a resident simply would just walk off, which they're allowed to leave the facility. It's not a locked facility. And every time it seemed as if he would walk to the store or walk away, they would call and want to report him as missing or we would have to go out and respond to that. Um, likewise, sometimes residents will get into, you know, a, a spat, if you will, um, between the resident to resident. As I said, there are certainly de-escalation techniques and things that can be done before they would call 911. So. Am I next? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> I have several questions. One, I would love to see these numbers on how many are coming in from out of county which counties are sending their personnel, their individuals with mental health crisis or other uh, to LMS County for placement, treatment, how it affects our schools. I would very much like to have those, those numbers, and I think we all would, and it would help us and legal staff know how to approach this. Uh, second item, the Vias View uh, Diversion Center will be open, and we think around what, November, December possibly, uh, of this year. And right. that will greatly expand what we're able to do in-house with VIA and, um, and the, the various facilities here. For the general public, that will house up to 16 beds. They are short-term for possible later placement of those individuals. Um, so that will be major in this county I rode by there this past week uh, in the building. The exterior is pretty much complete to a large extent. Um, and so it's going to take a while for us to move in. But once that happens, that will be a tremendous help to, I was going to say your problem, our problem. I, I think that would be major. Um, second question. Uh, well, and so then the question about how many are coming from out of county and, and so forth, but I would also want to know the types of case cases. Are they juveniles? Are they seniors? Uh, is it just a, a, a person with some dementia wandering off? Or is it uh, problematic kids that are, that are from here or from other counties that are being sent here for treatment uh, and the type of calls? And I would love to know where those calls are coming from inside of Burlington, inside of Graham, inside of uh, or outside in the uh, in the county. So I think that would help the sheriff and the county manager and, and the rest of us 
know how to plan. Uh, I think those are my major questions. Uh, you and I need to talk further this afternoon on how to implement part of this um, and you know, our placement on the JAC committee particularly. Yeah, I'll go back to the committee. As I said, I'm just um, help chair that committee. Um, I'm one of many representatives, but I certainly will say I don't think we're talking about Alzheimer's. We're talking about individuals with mental illness diagnoses, not Alzheimer's, not elderly people. We're talking about primarily younger um, individuals. I, I don't think we're, we're not addressing the the silver alerts or the the individuals with um with dementia i think that's why we need, need the actual numbers and know where we're really headed mm -hmm. so we'll do our best as i said um I, i'm not sure where that data is kept but i'm sure there has to be some way to get it at, with regard to out-of-county residents living in licensed facilities particularly if they're receiving medicaid for those individuals without breaching any confidentialities the individual that just wanders off to the grocery store and they call in is that city county that one particular one was in the county they were walking to the store or just leaving the facility that was a sheriff's office one and is that just lack of oversight in that facility or what would you guess is going on no, I think that the individual, you know, um, has a right. Um, they're not locked facilities to leave. Um, they do have typically a resident sign out sheet. I'm not sure in this case if he was signing out or just walking off. But in any um, case, um, in this particular instant, the officer would usually just find him walking and he was in no, he was not in harm's way or anything. He just decided he needed to get out. But it always would be a 911 call typically instead of them going out to look or sending someone out to look or you know that type so thing. would the answer then be social services going in and doing additional training on what you need to be doing or would it be somebody else so social services only monitors the family care and adult care they do not have a role with the licensed mental health facilities that's directly from the state so would that be via um, it could be VIA offering training, but typically when VIA or Cardinal Innovations in the press has offered training, there would be very little participation unless it's mandated as part of the licensure requirements. It's not likely you're going to get a large participation. And again, you go back to the state versus what yes. little we as the county can do. That's correct. <coughs> Any other questions? I just want Linda to follow up. I mean, um, we used to have a lot of mental hospitals. And this kind of became the new group homes as far as the change, more personal, more home. What, um, when we had a meeting, I was say Mr. Brown, was it Mr. Brown that was from uh, the DHSR? State? Yeah. Bryson. Mm -hmm. Okay, Bryson. Um, he talked about site home, siting these places. Yes. Like if they've gotten, mm -hmm. I mean, he would visit, what, once a year? His staff would visit these homes once a year? They do annual surveys. Okay. And they would site them. And what about the medication distribution? Is there a, what kind of person distributes that medication is it just a general staff person or is it someone who's medical like a nurse on site or how does that work because i'm not a licensure i'm not a licensure rule expert but i know in the family care homes and adult care homes they do have to have training yeah. um, or someone who is qualified as a medication tech or someone right. But typically it is done by the staff. I have no idea yeah. with regard to the group homes that well, are licensed by the state. This is a major responsibility to care for people who are struggling, no matter what age they yeah, are. Absolutely. And yes. you just you just always want to go and be around people who really know how but to But you make a good you. point. And we did um, stress mm -hmm. with the school system and with others, there's always, if it's adult protective services or child protective services, that's a call to DSS uh -huh. immediately. Um, if they suspect um, some violation, um, they can call the state uh, Division of Health Service Regulation to make a complaint, and they will come out to investigate that, and or if it's a DSS monitor facility, they will investigate. So there are other avenues. We don't mean to lead you to believe there are not avenues, but it's just we, we were asked as a Justice Advisory Council to form this task force and subsequent work group to look at the um, impact it was having on public resources. And you said something that just triggered what I was mentioning to Craig earlier before the meeting started is DSS. They've got extremely heavy load now with a short staff and when you talk about this bringing in law enforcement 
I mean, how does that work? Because you've, you're only one person. You can't be but, but one place at a time. And if you're carrying the load of four people that used to work there, that's, that's a bit much. And we just always want the care to be 110% perfect, so to speak, because these are lives of people who many times have not asked for their situation or whatever that looks like, especially young people that may not have a home, so to speak. Thank I'm going to, uh, we had a request or two or three requests for a 10 minute recess. So I don't want to stop you, and I do want to hear from Mr. Stevens, but we're going to take a 10 minute recess and then bring you back if, if you're willing. Sure. Thank you. Okay, we're in a 10 minute recess.
We're back in order. Okay, Miss Allison, you did not escape. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mr. Stevens, uh, while Miss Allison is at the podium, can you give us what we can and cannot do? Yes. Um, again, I, I think she summarized a lot of it. One of the last things that she said in response to one of the questions is that the role of the county related to DSS involvement is limited in a licensed uh, group home situation where mental health is involved. Um, again, I think Mr. Turner's question about um, 911 abuse or use uh, is instructive to me as far as what we need to research to help mm -hmm. pro hopefully propose moving forward. Um, I'm familiar generally with the type of situation that's being described here. I think there's a number of factors in play, and you can tell me if I'm wrong here, but it seems like there's a lot of concern on behalf of staff as to what liability may exist for them if they fail to report a resident who goes missing mm -hmm. uh, and they're incorrect about what type of activity is happening. Uh, but at the same time, on law enforcement side, there's uh, concern about abuse of resources, use of resources in a situation where it really doesn't necessitate law enforcement involvement. Is that generally what you're seeing? It is. Okay. Um, and is that the real ask in terms of what you need from us in terms of trying to help fix the situation? Well, I, th I think as I understand it, um, what we would like to know is for the ones who, it, it's, it's not an immediate response. It's not like a violent, uh, you know, crime or anything's been committed. It's literally just a mental health um, escalation of behaviors or whatever, and they're calling 911 for that, that we would want to help better educate them on these other resources or, or resources you should call right first okay um and there's really no teeth in that and then you couple that with the problem of uh limited training that they're required to have so that creates this um, problem which as we said it's while it may be you know 14 or 15 facilities i don't know a limited number out of all of these but the ones who chronically over and over and over are, are calling 911 or they're coming into the magistrate's office saying i want to take up ibc well it doesn't meet the criteria okay well then i want to press charges i want to so as a you know that that type thing right and the training requirements are a product of state licensure right it's not anything we do on the local level it is not right. we can offer it um, can I add to that because we took our law enforcement and we really via and started with Cardinal Innovations about really training our response officers whatever that's done to really know how to handle mental health situation crises. I mean a domestic violence call is the most dangerous for officers because everybody's just out of sorts they really are but the training for the housing of the mental health issue I would think needs to be really spot on just like we're expecting our officers to have this training, our social workers to have this training, um, any kind of training so that, because I cannot imagine, the, that's a tough job, it really is, and it's all the time, And but this is a tough population that deserves careful, excellent care. They're paying for it, you know? And um, so it's just something to think this training thing, I mean, we all go, we get trained to do our jobs, and that's why we're supposed to, to hold us accountable for what we do. And um, we all go to training, we do, and then I don't see why this group wouldn't either, because it's a business, and it's got folks in it that um, struggle. And you've gotta be on top of your game to handle this instead of constantly calling 911, because that may not need to be the call that you make, where they could be right. somewhere else in a really you know, crazy situation as well. I just think we're missing the boat here on having everybody that works in these situations training because when you send out these notifications and there are no-shows, that's concerning. Cause, um, and that's where we can um, advocate as, as a county with our legislators to possibly work on tightening or increasing the training requirement and licensure rule um, at, at the state. Yeah, because as much as I would like to be a pilot i can't just go to the airport and get in it <laughs> i mean you got to rip don't even <laughs> you don't even i know you're a you could. god help you, us you but i'm just saying you don't do any job unless you're trained to do it because if you don't you're going to fail soldiers mm -hmm. go through basic training law enforcement go through, i mean this is what we do because we want to do that job well this is no different i mean this is a high 
stressful job with a high stressful clientele, but they matter. Ms. Allison. I think you have a question. Yes, I do. You just reiterated the very question I just wrote down. Um, I think it would be incumbent upon us to get some knowledge about where we rank. If, we, if we're still number three, I think that adds some credibility to our request. Um, we might be able to engage Buncombe, I believe it was, and uh, Wake County to mm -hmm. sign on in this uh, in a resolution from our board of commissioners with their boards of commissioners to put some teeth in the requirements. If VIA is out offering training and people aren't willing to spend the time to try and get it, maybe make it required training and maybe we could produce a resolution requesting that our delegation <clears throat> take that sort of action. Maybe we can look at this at our next meeting. Addressing that issue, I've got a telephone call with Brian Ingram, who's the CEO for VIA, this afternoon. Um, so I can make that request. Um, I think as much as, well, we left Cardinal and went to VIA in 2020. Um, tremendous advantage for LMS County. We've very, very much improved the services and, mm -hmm. and so forth, and including the diversion center it will soon be open. Uh, but I suspect they would be willing to put on a session. They have so many experts and so forth, particularly in that area. They are willing, so. they, they have said, but as, as we said earlier, Cardinal did the same. They offered mental health first aid training. They would offer other trainings and even try to do it on a Saturday or so, you know, offer different sessions. But what you're gonna get is um, little participation because a lot of times the staff can't leave the right. facility to go and the owners, as far as having relief staff to allow them or investing in their staff to get more training is usually not um, something they're willing to do. Would it be the board's pleasure to have uh, either us as a board or our county manager to write a letter to these 128 facilities talking about, we'd have to arrange the training session first and then us as county commissioners and the county administration uh, support it and really try to encourage them to attend. And you might even think about doing some site visits so you can really see the house or the home or the whatever, maybe, and just see what it is we're talking about instead of hearing about it. Yeah, I've done that over the years and I suspect you have as well. And we have a VIA representative, as I said, that, that sits on the subcommittee so I can speak with her about Super. it. Mr. Stevens, anything else? No, I'm, I'm taking notes and trying to figure out exactly what we need to try to work on fixing here. And I think this has been instructive for me as to the issues. Um, I certainly, like I said before, there's a disjointed relationship between the county and the state mm -hmm. when it comes to overseeing and inspecting these facilities. But I do think there is a possibility for us to bridge that gap and either propose something mm -hmm. to the legislature or have something on a local level that is required of these facilities if we see a problem. So thank you for coming today. Thank you. Let me make this statement, and Mr. Stevens, correct me if I'm incorrect, but uh, yeah, we don't have zoning in the county, one, which, and I'm not advocating zoning, I am not, but we don't have, and the municipalities do have zoning in each and every of their uh, city limits. Um, so, you know, the cities really have much more control of these uh, entities than we do. So it's going to be particularly interesting to me to see how many are in the county and how many are in each of the cities. Um, but I think they, they, through their zoning, they'd have a lot more control than we have. Um, possibly. Um, there's at least one attorney general opinion that deals with zoning regulation of group homes by municipalities. And so the relationship there is a bit tenuous. I mean, they're, they're private businesses, but they're also residences of persons that are regulated in that way as well. So there's um, some limitation on zoning oversight, but interesting to see if they might try to do something different. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Stevens, I think you're up again. It is me again. Good morning, commissioners. 
I'm here to talk to you this morning about the ordinance that you'll find in your packet that we've drafted. Um, and this is one, uh, first of all, I want to say the issue that's before you today is not a new one before the board. There's been concern over firearms discharge in the county in the past. I know this came up uh, last year when uh, Ms. Bechtel was here with T. Campbell. And interestingly, uh, after I drafted this ordinance, I found that uh, she had drafted a very similar one that I don't know was pr presented to the board, but shared a lot of the same ideas in terms of how to deal with the issue. So as I go through this, I'm actually going to start at the end and work my way towards the beginning. I think that makes more sense in terms of how we work through the ordinance. And let me slow you down. Sure. We have to have two readings Correct. of this proposed ordinance. So. Um, when Mr. Stevens gets through his explanation, he'll actually do a reading. We cannot vote on it today. We have to have two separate readings. I'm sorry. That's correct. Yes, sir. Um, so after some changes made in the last couple of years in the legislature related to criminalized uh, local ordinances, there is, it does have to be two readings, two passages of the ordinance to make it effective as a misdemeanor, which is the way this one is outlined and drafted. So it's actually drafted to be both a uh, misdemeanor, uh, punishable by fine up to $500, and also potentially a civil penalty associated with this as well. Um, so that's section nine. Uh, section eight is, uh, when I started here, one of the things we have to look at is 153A-129 is the state law that outlines how a local government can regulate firearms. And there's listed specifically several things in there that a local government does not have control over when drafting an ordinance related to firearms. Uh, and those items are all included here as one, two, and three. So lawful hunting activities, uh, firearms used in lawful defense, and firearms you use pursuant to lawful directions of law enforcement officers. That's very odd wording, but I think basically what that means is firearms that are used either by law enforcement officers or at their direction. So if the sheriff were <coughs> to direct someone to use a firearm, we cannot decide that we want to regulate that further. Um, so then going back to the top, after starting at the bottom, um, the proposal is to regulate the discharge of firearms in situations where it's unsafe for a person to do so. There have been a lot of concerns brought to the board in the last year related to unsafe discharge of firearms. And I want to go ahead and say that I'm very cognizant of the fact that we should not be drafting laws to regulate the businesses or regulate certain businesses specifically. There's been a lot of concerns brought and I hope that the kind of things we're going to outline here in the ordinance are the types of things that most people who operate a firearm or operate a business where people discharge firearms can get on board with because it does all relate to safety. Um, so unlawful for a person to discharge a firearm except into a natural or constructed backstop adequate to stop the projectile. And again, that doesn't apply to trap shooting, skeet shooting, or sporting clays, or any other situation where it's impossible to stop the projectiles after they're fired. Firearm in this, in, in this uh, ordinance is going to relate to anything that uh, shoots a projectile that's powered by gunpowder. So I know in some firearms uh, laws in our state they only apply to modern firearms and not to antique weapons i think in this instance it makes more sense for us to prescribe the use of all types of firearms whether it's black powder or otherwise so they are all included in this ordinance it's also unlawful on this under the ordinance to discharge a firearm carelessly or heedlessly in disregard for the safety of others there is no state law that pres that prescribes the use or fire of a firearm in a careless or reckless manner. A lot of counties have enacted an ordinance in order to keep people from doing that. Uh, so we don't have one of those currently. I think in this instance, it makes sense for us to add something to that effect. It's also unlawful for any person to discharge a firearm in a manner that causes the projectile to leave the property on which it is discharged. We've heard a lot of testimony today, and I think in the past related to people firing firearms in situations where the gunshot leaves the property owned by the person in question um, and that can present safety issues for people who have adjoining property that don't want gunshots don't want projectiles on their property um, the ordinance is drafted in such a way that it has an allowance for a person who has written permission from the person where the projectile were to land from that person to make that okay so if you have a situation where you have a person who owns property 
or uses property and has a neighbor that doesn't have any objection to projectiles that might land on their property in their woods or whatnot, if they secure written permission from that person in advance and have it available for law enforcement to inspect, then that person would be exempted from that requirement of the ordinance. Also unlawful for a person to discharge a firearm in a situation where the person is under the influence of alcohol. Um, the definition of under the influence here is lifted directly from the state's uh, statutory definition of un under the influence that applies to driving. So um, that would be a .08 or higher on an intoximeter or any other evidence of appreciable impairment. So the standard here for a law enforcement officer investigating the level of intoxication would be exactly the same as if that person were too drunk to drive. Uh, so to simplify things and to make it easier in terms of enforcement, the standard is exactly the same, lifted from the same place, and references the same types of equipment used to test the alcohol in the person's system. Um, the ordinance would also make it unlawful for any person or business <coughs> entity to willfully allow another person on the property owned or leased by that person or business entity to discharge a firearm in violation of the ordinance. So again, in a situation where a person operates a business or has people on their property violating the ordinance, that person could be charged as well. So that's really what we're here to talk about today. You notice that in drafting the ordinance and talking about this, there's been no conversation about noise. Uh, we recently changed the noise ordinance in 2022. It seems robust in terms of what it allows for enforcement. Um, but this ordinance is not designed to regulate anything related to noise of shooting firearms. Um, if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer those, and then we'll go through with the reading. Yes, sir. One question. Um, I think the, I can't remember if the bill has passed or if it's in, I think it just came through the House to change the uh, level of intoxication from 0 .08 to 0 .05. Is that going to be in the same statute, or is it going to, are we going to have to rewrite this if we approve this? to a new statute number. Good so question, we, we would not have to. So that's not yet passed, but because the definitions referenced here are actually the definitions in general statute, uh, chapter 20, which deals with, with um, firearm, I'm sorry, deals with motor vehicles right. and intoxication and things like that. If those definitions change, then these definitions would change as well. And that's what I wanted to check on, thank yes. you. Good question. Mr. Terry, we'll start on your end. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, I got a question about a number of sections. Um, first of all, Section Eight, the um, the prohibition that nothing in the ordinance prohibits lawful hunting activities. So, if I'm shooting a deer during deer season, this doesn't apply. Correct. If I'm shooting at a deer outside of deer shooting season, this does apply. In theory, that's correct. Yes. Okay. So it's whatever's lawful hunting is exempt. That's correct. So if you're hunting within the law, then this would not apply. If for whatever reason you're hunting outside that period, you could be charged with a violation under uh, 113 and also potentially a violation of the ordinance. If, you're, if, you're, if your activity falls within the ordinance otherwise. That's correct. Um, all right, Section 3, the, the constructed backstop or natural barrier. I mean, this is an ordinance that would apply to the whole county. That's so, correct. So I'm, you know, I'm thinking, all right, I'm... I own 100 acres in Union Ridge. I'm on my property. I want to shoot some cans. I got my 22. W would I have to construct a backstop on my 100 acres to shoot cans from a 22? That's an excellent question. And so you'll see that it references a natural backstop. So depending on the caliber weapon you're firing, the gradient of the land, um, how much property there is, there may not need to be anything constructed. So as long as whatever is naturally there is adequate to stop the projectile in question, then that would be sufficient. But it says backstop. Correct. I mean, like, let's say I've got, I've got 100 acres that's clear cut, <coughs> but I'm shooting on the, you know, I'm shooting at the very tip. I'm shooting, I have 100 acres to shoot, and I'm shooting cans, and there's nothing... Would the ground be a backstop? That's correct. I mean, the, the idea here was in a situation where you know the caliber weapon you're shooting and you know that the range is limited to the land that you own, then there wouldn't be a requirement because, in effect, the land would be the backstop in that instance, yes. All right. I, I got a little concerned about it being kind of vague. I mean, okay. I, I wonder if... 
specifying that you know that the ground could be a backstop might be helpful because me reading that I, I'm thinking I'm thinking mound as I read that as a, as a normal interpretation of that language okay. I, I have a concern there um, section five um, written permission again I'm thinking you know, I, I'm living in Union Ridge I, I got my my neighbor next door hey man uh, you know, you mind if I, I, I want to shoot, shoot at these things, you mind if, if it goes into your property, is that all right? Yeah, just don't shoot my cows, right? I mean, I can imagine a conversation like that happening, and I'm wondering if the written permission is really required if I, if, if I and my neighbor agree that it's not a big deal if some rounds go in my yard. That's a great question, too. I, I enacted this part, I wrote this part mainly because of the fact that in a situation where uh, law enforcement's asked to investigate, it's going to be difficult it will. to try to get both parties on site to get permission. Um, having written permission on hand is something that you should procure ahead of time. It makes it easier for us to investigate this. If there's a question about whether or not you had permission at the time, um, I, I also thought about having some sort of a form that we could uh, we could hand out to folks and say, "Listen, here's a form that we'll recognize." as being adequate permission if you have your neighbor fill out this form and have it on hand, we'd like to see that. Um, so I think that makes it easier for law enforcement. That was mainly the intent. It does make it easy for law enforcement, certainly. Um, but, you know, the counter to that is that's what juries are for. Sure. You know, uh, you can't shoot on my property. He said I could. No, I didn't. We'll put it in front of 12 people. They figure it out. I, I worry about, I'm worrying a little bit about the, you know, law of unintended consequences where we, you know, you've got, you're trying to you're trying to make it so that you can enforce something at, at the expense of um, creating it more difficult for for your normal folks. That, that's my that's my concern about the balance here. The other thing is um, section seven unlawful for any person or business entity. I'm wondering about the word business. Um, why not just say entity? I mean, what's a business entity? What's a nonprofit? What's a club? What's a I mean, is there a reason to use the term business? Not necessarily. Uh, I mean, I think I think that word has uh, any of those meanings that you just outlined. I mean, it could be any a nonprofit, a for-profit, uh, and we can certainly say entity. So there, there's no reason necessarily that word had to be used. We can certainly strike that. I'll go back to your question about Section Five, though. Above, um, I do think part of it as well is an effort to eliminate over-enforcement. Um, so if written permission yeah. exists, then the deputy on hand might not make a charge in a situation where the deputy might feel compelled to charge otherwise. So I think that could cut either way. That's a good point. Those are my questions, thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, as to the ground as a backstop, I can't count the times I've seen significant ricochets off rocks you didn't even know were in the ground. Uh, especially if you're shooting something more high power than a 22, and uh, when that when you get a ground ricochet, it can go up, down, around, back. I mean, I've seen them come right back at the gun at the uh, at enclosures. So you have to be extremely careful about shooting into the ground. I really don't even like to do that. But uh, you, when you get a you get a rock under the ground, you hit it this on this face of that rock, and it could come right back at you. So they're a lot of good reasons for not shooting at the ground unless you've cultivated it and know there's nothing there. Um, and I'm not even sure you can do that and be certain of it. But um, the, uh, as far as language is concerned, I think having a form might be a good idea uh, for um, somebody to, for two individuals to exchange and sign or even put the language online on our website so that people won't, if we, approve the ordinance, there will be a language there on our website that if people want to exchange an agreement, they can print it, sign it, they've got it, they don't even have to come to the county office to get it, so. Um, that would be the idea, yeah. is to have it ready to distribute. Um, I, I've got some, you know, I've got some concerns about the backdrop as well. I mean, like I said, shooting into the ground, I think is probably one of the worst mistakes you can make sometimes. Uh, May I have just a follow-up? Sure. If it seems like Section 5 
I'm sorry. Section three might be covered by section five. And that I mean, is there a, is there a need for section three at all? <coughs> if if it's unlawful for the round to exit your property, is there a need for section three, which specifies how it needs to stay on your property? I can see how those might be duplicative. Yes. Well, um, I think that's what Steve is saying. If you've got um, a berm, that's I'm assuming state regulated. Uh, you're not, uh, and it is not. It's no, and that's part of why we're having this conversation is that there's very little regulation in terms of how a shooting range or any other informal uh, shooting should take place under state law. Um, basically, state law just says don't shoot into somebody else's house or vehicle, um, and that's it. And, and so there's concerns been addressed or, or been posed to the board in addition to that, and we're just trying to help short some of that. Well, to finish my comment, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know if you would call it rabid, but that fact is a little, a little over the top, but I'm a strong, personally, I'm a strong Second Amendment supporter myself. I think most of the members are all the members on our board are. Um, we're struggling with this issue. It's a, it's a tough issue. And we really want to come up with something that protects, I think, even the people that we've heard speak concerning uh, over overshooting have uh, also been Second Amendment supporters. I don't know that any of them don't shoot, I, but I don't know. They haven't made a comment to that effect. But um, We've got to find some sort of middle ground, I think, in here that we can come up with a resolution or with an ordinance that does work for all the parties. Hey, Mr. Lynch. Oh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I don't really have a whole lot to add because um, I had very similar questions as, as Mr. Turner, and I heard your answers. Uh, I did have a good job coming back around because you cut my last one. I, I actually thought the same thing that Mr. Turner said, and I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I actually thought that uh, Section 3 was covered in Section 5 as well, and that's one of the questions I had. It just seemed redundant. Uh, but I just did want to say that I'm glad you made that statement about the written permission. Uh, I've had written permission to hunt on private property for 30 years. Uh, we did it before it was cool because we wanted everybody to be on the same page, and if Mr. Johnson, Sheriff Johnson sent out his deputies out here, we were covered because everybody was on the same page. So I can understand a, a little bit why that written permission does seem to work. And I'm sure, like Mr. Turner said, uh, these neighbors talk to each other. I don't know any neighbors that, w that live out in the county who don't know their neighbors quite well and converse with them on a daily basis. Uh, so that's one of the things I think the written permission is sort of like, you know, you can leave it or take it. But I, I generally, I believe that it probably helps all parties involved, and it's just a formality in most cases. Uh, and all the times that I've had written permission to hunt on people's property, I've had one encounter over the last 35 years, and that was a wildlife commission guy looking for my license. <laughs> so um, I understand everything you said, and thank you so much for, uh, for putting this together and, and sort of directing us through this, and maybe we have some more, um, more questions on, on before the second reading. Of all the people, me, to ask questions. I have a BB gun, so, and I have a pistol too. Don't worry. Um, how long has this gun range, whoever owned it, has been there? When did it become in existence? Does anybody know? Well, I, I, again, I'm not really here to talk about. I know, but I am because I want to know how long this has been there if it's just been there or has it been there prior and like why now if, if it's been shooting you see what I'm saying if there's always been shooting why now is there complaints because noise is noise and I'm, I'm not either side I'm, I'm wanting to right. figure this out I don't have an answer as to the date that the business that was discussed this morning uh, came into existence okay. but I know that these issues have popped up more and more over the last couple of years okay and again I not to dispel anything, but I really do want to insist that I'm not presenting this today because of anyone's um, issue with a particular business. And I think it's important that we as the board remember that if we were to enact a law, it's of uniform application outside of right. the municipalities in the county. 
and not directed to one business. Right, and that's, um, I think Mr. Russell said there are other outdoor ranges? I believe there are, yes. Okay, but we haven't had those folks here. Not to my knowledge. Okay. Um, Ms. Thompson, just to offer you this item that was presented in earlier comments. Yeah, I got that. Talks I'm about just... when the property changed hands. And... Okay. Well, that's, let me correct that. That's a deed of trust. It meant that monies were borrowed. It has no... It's just... It a... could be a representation of ownership. It may not. A deed of trust is when you borrow money and have security. And that's what that is. That's not a deed. Between the buyer and the seller of the property. Okay. That's a deed of trust. I'm sorry, Ms. Thompson. That's all right. Um, okay. I'm not done. Oh, I thought you, uh, when you said okay, I thought you No, I'm okay. saying okay to you interrupting me. I'm not done yet. So, um, no big deal. Um, you know, this is, this is like we had the gentleman that come in here that had his driveway and he wanted to build his garage. He had permission from his neighbors with an engineer and a lawyer and it didn't quite meet the ordinance. You know, every situation is different based on just... Um, I'm done. It doesn't matter. It'll matter later. I'm done right now. Sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Because I sit here when others are talking, I keep my mouth shut. But when I'm talking, it's no big deal, and it's just rude, uh, and I'm sick of it. Because I don't do that to you. So it's, it's just really treat me as an equal, because I am. So thank you. I formally apologize. I do too. Okay. Oh. Uh, my lifetime I've done a lot of hunting. Um, August, September, you're going to have dove season that will open. Um, you're shooting bird shot with probably 16, 20 gauge, 12 gauge, whatever, but not anything that's going to, and it often will go, the little bird shot, may well go into an adjoining property owner's property. So is every dove hunter going to have to go to every, and you, the doves are not necessarily, they're not lined up to come in one necessary direction or angle. So are you going to have to go out before you dove hunt and get permission from any number of adjoining landowners? Um, no, we expressly, um, or I expressly excluded here hunting activities and then also any sort of trap shooting, skeet shooting, sporting plays, that kind of stuff. I mean, it's, it's just impossible in those situations Correct. to know where your, your shot's going to land. So we've, we've taken that out. All right. I, I think that's really important. Um, and I agree with Mr. With Mr. Turner about the berm issue and, and so forth. Um, grew up on a... 150-acre farm, um, and if we crossed over into the adjoining neighbor's property, it was okay. We never had written permission. We always had, you know, just they crossed into our property. Uh, I crossed into theirs. It was just not a big deal. Uh, times are changing, and that's unfortunate in many respects. But, uh, you know, I just think we need to be really, really careful uh, and I don't know how much liability we would incur if we generate the, the uh, permission or whatever. That, as Mr. Turner has already indicated, is a 12 jury decision in many cases, particularly in civil litigation, could be in criminal. Uh, I'm just concerned about how deeply we go into this. I absolutely agree that you should not be shooting uh, projectiles with the possible exception of BB guns and pellets and, <laughs> uh, and bird shot uh, into your neighbor's property and causing particularly injury. One of the photographs, they were showing a tree that had a projectile into it. Uh, that's not where you want to be. 
uh, and we need protection, but so I don't want to just be so overbearing mm -hmm. that we do away with too much. We go overboard. I appreciate that feedback. Um, again, like I said before, there's nothing here um, that regulates possession of firearms, nothing here that regulates the carry of firearms. Um, the idea was to help give some framework for the idea of um, proper and responsible discharge of those firearms. So, um, and certainly, like I said, we want to stay in our lane at the county level in terms of how we regulate anything related to carry. Uh, we just want to make sure folks have some idea as to how to discharge things um, safely. So, would the board like me to go back and reconsider some of the uh, comments today and make some revision, or if I, if I may, what, what is the procedure if, if we? alter the language in this proposal at all, does it start a new two-week process? I think it probably should. Um, and what I could do for the next meeting is I could even bring um, several different variants and we can vote up or down uh, <coughs> the ones that we find to be the most um, well-tailored to the situation. Yeah. So I do think if we're going to make any revision, we should just start again and we'd have two more meetings where we would pass. I, I think that's wise, Mr. Chairman. Okay, and, I, and I just want to thank Mr. Stevens. This is not this is not easy, no, particularly in this county. Not at all. So, I appreciate your efforts on this and trying to find a, a balance. And, and Mr. Chairman, I, I'd be interested in the sheriff's comments, particularly Absolutely. on this written permission uh, idea on, on his thoughts of that, on whether that's a good idea or not. Well, I think it's a good idea for written permission because we get called all the time out. Um, you know, people trespassing, etc. If they've got written permission, they're fine. Uh, there have been uh, trespassing signs put up and people go hunt on people's property without permission, then there's a possibility of us can make an arrest. Let me slow you down there. The question is going to be, are we requiring the hunter to carry that permission on him at all times? Yes, that's, that's correct. That's required by North that's, Carolina State yeah. Wildlife Commission. That's exactly right. No, hunting license, yes. Uh, no, on private no. property. Yeah. Right. No, I yep. didn't know that. that. That changed about 10 years ago once they were mm -hmm. leading what Mr. Johnson was saying. Yeah, so this was adapted to be substantially similar to that. I'd like to go uh, a step further, to, if y'all if will allow me. Uh, uh, I know Rudy. Real well. He, and he says that there's no alcohol being served uh, on a range, and certainly um, I know he wouldn't have a problem with that being in here. And, uh, you know, you're talking about shooting and going into the ground. I think if it's... Uh, it, it, States here, it's unlawful for any person to discharge a firearm carelessly and needlessly in disregard for the safety of the other. You're old enough to know if you got a gun and using a gun, how far that that projectile should go. Uh, it's on your box of ammo, isn't it? Do what? It's on your box of ammo. Yeah, you're absolutely right on that. And uh, you know, uh, I like this old, these ordinances. I'll just tell you, Sheriff, I like these on here because, like I say, everything that they're saying in here, they say they're not doing, you know. And so I don't think uh, they have a problem with that. But let me tell you, when you get a number of citizens that's coming in here complaining, uh, certainly as, a, as the sheriff, unless we have something, there's not a doggone thing we can do other than keep responding, keep responding, keep responding, and keep responding. And... Uh, uh, I think also I, I like that it's unlawful for any person or business entity. I assure you, if I think if Rudy knew they were shooting out, uh, that certainly uh, puts him in a position where he he better know uh, who's shooting there. And I, you know, I'm a Second Amendment man all the way. I love guns. I love shooting guns. But uh, you know, something's got to be put in this in place in this county to ensure that the public remains safe. Let me ask you this question. Yes, sir. With a uh, gun range where you're paying for the right to shoot on the range, are they required to have a safety officer or someone on the range at all times? No, there's no legal requirement for that on right. state law. Right. And that could be what has happened in some of these complaints. I think some of them are legitimate, some of them may not be. But I know... I know if, I, if I don't own a gun range, by the way, but if I did... I'd have a safety officer on, on the range at all times. The, the board may have seen in the past um, the presentations of public speakers, a certain set of rules that the Wildlife Commission publishes for all of their ranges. 
Um, those rules apply to the ranges that are operated, operated by the Wildlife Commission. Um, it's probably a best practices set of rules that any range could adopt, but they're not required by state law on ranges other than those adopt, operated by the state. And like I say, I've got a picture here. Uh, Rudy, you know, has rules on his range. Uh, and we just need to make sure what rules he has on there uh, are followed just like if we pass this ordinance. But the thing is, without an ordinance, he could call us down there and say he's having problems on his range with somebody, and all he can do is order them off. There's no law that we can charge if they're shooting into other people's property. So something needs to happen, and that's up to y'all to make it happen if and when you decide to. This is a, Thank you. a good point. It protects the owner of the business as well. So you have yeah. Can I speak for a second as an expert witness? Because I am in firearms. Just give me one minute. More? Yes or no? He's the owner of the place we're talking about. Yeah. I don't have a problem with it. I do not either. Yes, sir. So you are correct, uh, Steve. As far as shooting down, that's why 20 degrees is the max you can go. Uh, so that is correct. That's a... a that's a standard term. The state does recognize real property, as the attorney said, in that as long as there's not a house or constructed, a tree is not considered what they call real property in the statute. So here's the here's what's really going to happen. And I'm going to tell you what's going to happen if you pass this ordinance. Let's say a customer comes to my range, and he's sitting at the bench, he sneezes, whatever, fires the gun, it hits the steel target at a bleak angle, ricochets off, and could possibly leave the berm. Like you said, ricochets go different directions. Ricochets off out of the range and hits a tree. Somebody sees that and goes, oh, well, they shot my tree. It wasn't intentional. Now, what's going to happen here is I'm going to get a $500 fine or the person shooting is going to get a $500 fine because I'm going to post the ordinance if you do that so that I've been willful. I'm not willfully doing it. I'm saying don't do it. So at the end, it's going to go on the customer who made a simple mistake. No real property was damaged. The squirrels didn't call the sheriff. The, you know, the, the duck didn't call the sheriff that got shot in hunting. And here's the thing, if you're hunting, uh, this is why I kind of look over that way. If you're hunting, you have to target and sight in your rifle. So you're telling me because somebody, when they buy a rifle, and this is where you need a firearms expert, and I would actually be happy to be on a subcommittee for this. You have to sight that rifle in. We do it all the time. So when you sight that rifle in, you're going to be off, okay? It's not going to be much. I mean, we get on paper. But you could be off. Your sight, you could have dropped your rifle and it could be off. So why is it okay for hunting? Because there's a law that protects that, but not for shooting. So if you're going to do an uh, ordinance in the county to protect rangers, protect the ones that are here. Invite the owners of the rangers here so we can show you. I welcome everybody to my range. The sheriff, anybody, ALE, ATF, they can come at any time and inspect our facility. We have nothing to hide. Our laws are clearly posted on all ranges. We have safety protocols. We are the only range that is staffed. He's right. You don't have to be staffed. But I took it to the next level. We set the example in this county. That's why Terry and John and I, we work together. Okay? If you're a felon, don't come to Rad Range because they will report you. And we've done it, correct? Okay? We're, we are law-abiding citizens. We are Second Amendment supporters. Okay? I've been doing this for years, guys. I'm telling you. This, all that's going to happen is the neighbors that are complaining for noise will shoot their own tree and say, we did it. The sheriff's going to come and you're slapping you with a fine or my customer fine. And we don't even know if that actually happened. That's why I said you might want to park a sheriff's deputy there with CSI to do forensics. Because that's doing what, those pictures that they're showing, those could have been there from 10, 15, 20 years ago. We don't know. It could have been yesterday. I don't know. But we have range officers out there. I mean, we do the best we can. We're not violating the law. We're trying to enforce the law and make shooting in Alamance County the safest. I have literally created the most actively used range in Alamance County as a business owner. That's why you're getting all these complaints, because we're so successful. So we're punishing the small business owner who was successful. So. Let me ask you this. Yes, sir. The allegation about alcohol, do you serve alcohol? We do not. No. Right. You, we serve water, food, Gatorade, like snacks and chips, maybe a hot dog occasionally, and that's about it. Any questions? Can I ask him a question? Absolutely. Are there any new housing developments that are wanting to go up around your property? Yes, Ms. Uh, Thompson. So this has been pulled to light. If you look at the GIS, 
Uh, 18 houses were built on 62, where the 1776 sign was, which has been there for years. And we're talking like 1994, 1995 area. That's why 1976 protects us. 18 houses were built there. Uh, and then Three Brothers LLC, which is a real interesting LLC. I've, I, you know, state, Secretary of State's pretty good. I can't see who owns that, which is odd. Uh, they took out, they clear cut like 33 acres of land. Um, that's encroachment on us, but even they clear cut it. Um, it seems to me as this is a, a straight up land grab. They, there are certain people that own certain business, uh, certain businesses, me and Richard, that do not want to sell. We don't want to sell our property. We want to sell our business. It's not for sale. We want to be left on devices to operate our business as, as corporate citizens of the county. But it seems to be, and I've gotten letters um, from PM Real Estate and other realtors and phone calls stating that, you know, right after last meeting, I got two phone calls wanting to sell my property. And I told them I'm not interested. And they well, well, we'll offer you this now because if you wait, it's going to go down because they want to develop houses. They put a gas line right down Fawcett Lane. Has not hooked anybody up to it yet. And we're not talking a small gas line. We're talking like a big industrial for, think about Heritage Glen but just out there and Fawcett Lane being the direct drive through. And if you look at the people that own those, you know, Dunn, McKinsey, all these, they are the biggest land. And then Three Brothers LLC, those are the biggest land holders right there. They want to sell this land, this farmland they bought real cheap to make <coughs> properties and homes. And they want us out because no one wants to live next to the gun range. The people that buy those homes should sign waivers. I mean, I'll donate a box of 100 earplugs if that'll help. But yes, Ms. Thompson, that there is a, a property going up and three brothers LLC and the other if you look on GIS you can see these tracts of land being bought up. Thank you. The Thank one you. that Ms. Thompson is referring to, where is it in relation it's, to is it on sixty two? Is it on it's on Fawcett and sixty two. So where Fawcett and sixty two come together at the north part. Right. They clear they had built a eighteen homes in that section on sixty two. Then Three Brothers LLC, like I said, this LLC is really weird. I, I, I can't even, with my connections, find out who is the owners of this LLC. I can tell you how, how to do that. Uh, yeah, I'm curious. The Secretary of State's uh, site. I did? Uh, go to that specific LLC. It'll give you a registered agent. It uh, lists another LLC. That's weird. I'm sorry? It lists another LLC. That's why I was just saying. That's it doesn't... possible, but it, you can go to that LLC. There's a registered agent for each of those. Right, it just keeps kind of going. If you look at it, you'll see what I'm saying. Something's kind of wishy-washy, but I don't, I don't know. It just looks like something, they're trying to hide something. And this is, again, I'm not an expert witness on that part, but I can tell you something's wrong because they, they clear-cut they clear 33 acres of land. When I say clear-cut, it sounded like a, you talk about the noise our range makes, it sounded like a transformer, like in the movies, was coming right through the woods for like three or four weeks straight. And I was like, what is that? And I go down there and they're just, I mean, it's a machine, it grabs a tree, yanks it out and trims it, cuts it, throws it on a pot. And they were just saw, you know, saw milling it. And devastated 33 acres of forest, wildlife, deer population. I mean, the deer hunter was up here. He ain't gonna shoot those deer because they have no homes no more. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is a problem when you have urban sprawl encroaching on the county. There's only three outdoor ranges of the county. There's, what, 175,000 people in this county? Where are they going to go? Shoot out their backyard and accidentally hit and kill somebody? That's the real threat. We have a range that's safe. And you see in the packets I gave you, we shoot 20 degrees down angle. When you're sitting on our bench, the gun is pointed 23 degrees, uh, 22 degrees down, like almost this way to the berm. You can't go any lower than that. You start having issues. If you go any lower in 20 degrees. Board, any other questions? Okay, is it the pleasure of this board to, thank you, sir. Oh. Is it the pleasure of this board to send it back to Mr. Stevens, our county attorney, and then present it at our next meeting with, uh, and not actually do a reading today? Yes. Yes. Sure. Ms. Thompson? Yeah. Okay, so it's all five. Mr. Stevens, it's in your, your ballpark. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. I assume that's your next. I'm next. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning still. I'm actually going to come up here to present the CIP. <laughs> yeah. 
It's a little tricky to sit there and also look at a PowerPoint screen. So <laughs> let's see if this is this works better for all of us. I'm presenting your uh, proposed capital improvement plan for your upcoming five fiscal years. This is a little different process than what you may have done in the past. We're wanting to get this out ahead of your recommended budget since capital spending is a major driver uh, in the upcoming recommended budget. So this is really just paving the way for our proposed budget um, that'll be coming to you in a couple of weeks. All right, so your capital improvement plan, we call it a CIP for short, is really just a planning tool. Uh, it's a living document that changes as your needs and your priorities change. Uh, this year we have upped the minimum uh, threshold. It used to be less than that, so we are um, only funding projects that cost $50,000 or more. The smaller projects we'll take care of in the operating budget. This CIP <coughs> document includes the needs of the county, uh, of the school system, and of the community college. So all of those are contained in here. Again, we review this annually. We're bringing this before you, but we're only asking for you to appropriate funding for your upcoming fiscal year. So although it spans five years, you only fund it on an individual um, annual basis. Your county capital needs, um, we are finding that we are really just playing catch up on lots of overdue and deferred maintenance needs. And so we are trying to transition from catching up on all of those to moving towards a more proactive approach to meet the growing needs of the county. So just since I've been here, we've added more buildings. The county currently owns and maintains approximately 40 buildings so the appropriation that you have been making to maintain your capital investments really isn't enough to keep up with the growing number that we have so you've been previously funding about three hundred thousand dollars annually and we are recommending that you take your annual capital investment for county facilities up to about 2.3 million that is more in line with the capacity and the needs that we see um, this is also a little closer in line to what you're spending on school capital of 3.3. So 2.3 is what we're slating for next year. And the recommended projects that would come from this general fund appropriation, I've listed some of them there. You can find those on page 34 of your document. So this is just trying to help you navigate the booklet that you received this morning. Uh, page 34 will list those general fund projects that we're talking about. Um, I have one other slide here for county capital needs. You have other projects that you're taking care of in fiscal year 24 that are going to be coming from other funding sources. You can find those on page 35 of your document. And I've listed there, um, I've given you a bulleted list there, but it also contains the funding source other than um, your general fund. So we sometimes call the general fund appropriation PAYGO, but we're wanting to just clearly state and clear up any confusion or, or uh, help clarify exactly where that funding is coming from. So that would be a general fund. All right, your next slide contains a list of some of the ABSS capital needs. We are recommending a continued annual general fund investment uh, for the school. So that is the $3.3 million that we talk about. That's PAYGO. That's coming from your general fund. That would support uh, ongoing capital needs for the schools. So that is different than what uh, we've talked about with your debt model. So I want to clarify that the $3.3 million is not something we've discussed changing. The appropriation that we have talked about changing is related to debt service. The model was developed with a different level of uh, interest rate, a different value of a penny, and so we were talking about an adjustment there related to, to what goes towards debt service, not the ongoing PAYGO. So that would remain consistent at $3.3 million. That's no change. And found on pages 10, of the document are the PAYGO or the general fund appropriation projects. And then on pages 12 and 13, you'll find the projects that are funded with other funding sources. 
So there are numerous other projects other than what's bulleted here that you're funding with capital reserves, uh, lottery proceeds, and then again those bond proceeds. And nothing has changed with capital reserve or lottery proceeds either. The item on page 10, is yes. this the list from the from that ABSS prepared in their, their list of priority items? Let me get to that real quick. Yes, so this is what we receive from them in terms of what they're planning to right. spend. Uh, we keep that very general because you remember that counties don't really have the ability to line item each project, right? You're, you're sort of doing a more general flooring, painting, categorical expenditures for school needs, different than, than what we'd be looking at for county expenditures. So the money for cameras that we approved for the school systems last year would be under safety and security? That's correct. Okay. Which is $3.10 million. Uh, do you know what the security camera cost There's was? Three million All cameras? 10, or no, just no, 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 not Western. cameras, but oh. under safety and security. It's three million, million ten thousand. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, I see what that's, you're saying. Over, over well, that's years. the total over five years, right. right? So for safety and security next year, we're looking at 1.4 million. And you spent approximately 1.2 in the current year, or budgeted approximately 1.2. Have they ordered those cameras yet? That came up in the meeting, I believe it was Monday night, didn't it? That's correct. I don't have an update on their security cameras, but would be happy to get that from the superintendent for you. I can you. give it to you. I was in the meeting. I can let you guys know. <laughs> we know you were. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, the, 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 the question is, well, I want to make sure I'm really, really specific in my answer here. You want to know how much the, the cameras were offered up at $500,000 for the Western Middle School portion of the security cameras. That work has not been even started yet. And yet, and I ask all the commissioners, how long did you allocate this money to them? Right. And how long has it been since they didn't get the job done? Those are the kind of hard questions we need to ask from the school people, the people who have the answers. And I'm asking the school, uh, Mr. Hooks, to come and give us We've been, me and Mr. Turner have been asking for three months for an update. We ought now understand after Monday night why there was no update. There's nothing to update. So why are we going to be, I've asked the lawyer this too, why are we going to be so focused on helping them fix their problems when the work doesn't get done? Why don't we have a more efficient model instead of having to give the school system money in which we have no say so over it, like Ms. Port York said, we don't have an, a line item to affect that. So why are we being so aggressive in funding these things that don't get funded? At what point in time, as a commissioner's board, are we going to ask the hard questions of the finance director, of the superintendent? Where is this thing going? Where has the ball been dropped? Those are questions that every single person I spoke to this weekend are asking these questions. So as a representative of the citizens and the taxpayers of Alamance County, I intend going forward to ask these questions. I actually want to see, how, what did you do with my $3.3 .3 million I gave you last year? Right. What'd you do with it? What projects have been completed? Secondly, when we're looking at the finance director, shouldn't the finance director of the school system know how much money we gave them last year? Shouldn't yep. that be on the tip of her tongue? I'm just making a challenge to the finance director of the school system. Start making yourself valuable as a team member and a valuable person to this board so we can find out these answers because everybody's asking. After Monday night, a lot of people are asking questions. What's being done and what recourse do we have to make sure that the school system is, is, is taking care of the priorities that we gave them? We stepped out as a board. When I talked to the finance director, he told me he wanted $7.7 .7 million. After talking to this board, we realized that we needed to focus on safety and security, and that's where the cameras came from. Mm -hmm. And I'm not gonna lie to you, when I was in that meeting Monday night, I was extremely disappointed that those cameras hadn't been done. Because I spoke to the finance director, I spoke to the superintendent, I spoke to the board members to see how important this was and what got done. Nothing. Mm -hmm. That hurts my feelings. And I know the taxpayers of Alamance County aren't happy about it either. And once again, we're coming up into a budget process in which we're going to give them another $3.3 .3 million without accountability. 
Now going forward, that's all I'm gonna ask from the school system is accountability for what you asked for and what you have done because that's the same thing that I have to answer to the taxpayers for. Now, one thing that I think needs to be changed to create a, an efficient organization for the school system is being able to have those line items. We give them $50 million and this board has no say-so over it. None whatsoever. When we see things that aren't going properly, we get pointed fingers that we're ruining a relationship and we're asking just the hard questions of why and transparency for the taxpayer because that's who I have to answer to. So when I give this money to them and I have to wait for things to get done, it's extremely disappointing. And I don't believe that that's how this whole thing was designed to work. Now, I apologize for going off, but I just wanted to make a, make a point that we are doing everything we possibly can to fund the school systems through capital improvements, through uh, paying the teacher supplement and continuation budgets. Mm -hmm. All I'm asking the school system is, is be reciprocal of that. I mean, be Johnny on the spot. Be the person that comes to us and say, hey, look, we, we, we need to do some work here. So I'm just asking this board, you know, and asking the, the school system to come to us and tell us exactly what they paid the $3.3 million for this year if you expect to get the same amount next time. And, and, and I, uh, I know that Mr. Lashley and I both have talked about, and Mr. Stevens, this is a question for you. Can we, for example, the $500,000 last year out of budget that we approved for the cameras and still have not been completed, could we then recall that money or can we give it conditioned upon completion upon a certain date? Can we qualify? Yeah, I researched that issue for you, for you both last week and I think the answer there is that once the capital funds are allocated to the schools, then um, the school board is the ultimate arbiter of how and when those funds are spent. Um, we do decide how much goes to them for capital and routine expenses, but they do have recourse in a situation where the schools feel that the board has underfunded operations and or capital expenses for the schools. So it's kind of a give and take, um, as you alluded to before. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think that falls under our preview because it can't, 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 can't claim that we haven't been funding the schools in the proper fashion because um, it's proven to us that the money hasn't been spent the way we allocated it. So I don't think I have to worry about that so much, but I do hear what you're saying. I guess my problem is, is to make it a more efficient model, maybe we could hold back some of these, this money for these projects. Because to me it seems ridiculous to hand an organization $3 million and wait nine months and nothing's been done because I have other departments that I have to look after. And I could use that, I mean, if you can't spend it in a year, I could use that allocation to help another department why this particular system tries to figure out how to spend the money that I've given them already. So that's how I'm looking at it. It's almost looking at it like um, maybe a piecemeal fashion in which uh, a particular project gets an RFP. RFP is approved by the school board and then the school board hands it over to our, our team and we fund it, and they'll wait for the next project. Yeah. Rather than give them a whole lot of money to sit on, because um, in, in these times, six months, a year ago, it didn't matter if you held on to a million dollars. You couldn't get anything out of the bank for it, correct? Because mm -hmm. getting half percent, well now those cha changed. Now we have four, five and a half percent in, uh, interest rates. Mm -hmm. That would impact another department if we have to go out there, for example, and borrow the money to uh, fund these departments. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the school system has to understand that you just can't sit on money for months and months on time. They're not the only department in the county. We have other departments that need our need, need our, 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 our vision as well. And that's the only thing I'm saying is like, you know, I'm looking direction toward you because we can see that something's not working properly. And how do we get it to work in a more efficient manner? If it's not working properly, how can we work it in a more efficient manner? And the, and the funding is an efficient manner. Sure, I understand your question and I understand the issues that you're raising. Um, all I'm saying is at least the statutory framework that deals with how we fund mm -hmm. the schools at the county level doesn't seem to support that level of oversight on an ongoing basis. Um, and like I said before, uh, the funding 
it has to happen or they have recourse for having not funded. So there is a, a scheme there for some conversation and even a, a mediated uh, conference related to it if there's an ambiguity or, or disagreement about funding. But in terms of um, the RFP system that you alluded to, I understand what you're saying. I'm just not sure the statute supports that. I don't either. Uh, and like, this is all new. And But when you have situations like this, you have to sort of uh, think outside the box and readjust the way you have been approaching problems to start with. Sure. Understood. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad I was able to play straight man to Mr. L. Ashley. Um, <laughs> um, I agree with what Bill's saying. I mean, if, we, if we're going to commit the $3.3 million, it needs to get spent. If it can't be spent, the question becomes why. And I, I want to address an issue that's been coming up over and over and over again. I'm the only member of the current board who was here in, in 2019 when we funded, planned on funding the bonds and funding the debt service. The money that was set aside for, capital, uh, for the capital plan for, was for debt service. The penny allocation was for debt service. Now, I don't know why we didn't take into account the fact that the value of the penny goes up. We all know that. But for whatever reason, when we had allocated the dollar amount, it was a portion of the tax rate. What we really should have done, and of course we couldn't do that at the time because we hadn't funded the bonds and we didn't know what kind of rate we were going to have. But we assumed a pro an approximate rate, which turned out to be high in the first place, which means there's more money allocated <coughs> in that provision than is necessary to service that debt. So the m extra money was never intended to be additional funds for ABSS. It was intended to be to provide sufficient funds for, to meet the county's obligation to service the debt on the bonds. So if people keep claiming we're taking money away from ABSS by bringing that dollar amount into a line, they're wrong. We plan to service the debt on the bonds. And I think they just misnamed the fund. Exactly. They named it ABSS Capital Fund. That was not. It was Bond Repayment Fund. They just mislabeled it, I think, which caused the confusion. Well, two things. Commissioners, you have a responsibility to make sure that you're using taxpayer money efficiently. Right. And if adjustments need to be made to right size costs, you know, I think that's absolutely necessary at times. And secondly, to make Commissioner Lashley's point, both the superintendent and I are, are both very committed to being accountable and being transparent. So I'd love to sit down with him and talk about how we can develop a, a report that shows you exactly what's being spent, when, and what the needs are going forward. Well, we had a, uh, a website that was set up to desi design to do this. And we, we still have that. In fact, I reference it at the end here. Um, please take a look at that. And if there are additional uh, requests or, or ways to show it a little, uh, a little more clearly, we'd be happy to work that's, on that's that. That's how I directed folks who asked me about this. I directed to the website. OK. Let me add to that. Uh, chairman of the uh, Amherst County Alamance Board and School System is present, okay. and we thank you. Uh, but the two, the superintendent and the county manager, and the two chairs meet at least monthly uh, currently. And I think we've got a meeting coming up either later this week or next week. Uh, and so I, I'm sure that will be addressed. Okay, I'm going to move on if that's okay. Um, our next slide is looking at the needs for Alamance Community College. And we do have a slight increase in the investment of general funds uh, to address their needs. You'll see some bulleted lists there for their projects. Um, the PAYGO or the general fund appropriation can be found on page 24 of your document. And then on page 25, you'll find the projects that are slated for other funding sources. Uh, those are bond proceeds, two projects that you're well aware of, the Public Safety Training Center, and then their main PAL and G buildings that they've been working on. Uh, those bond proceeds are moving forward this fall. And then there's also um, a dedicated funding source from your ARP funds uh, for 500000 to do a water and sewer line extension there. As well. So does that money then, we voted on that, right? You did. So it's been sitting in an account waiting. 
That's correct. Okay. Yep. And um, like the public safety training center, no ground has been broken, right? Right. And you're asking about the funds that you voted mm -hmm. on. That was the ARP piece. Right. Yeah. I just want to be clear that. Well, the I'm, yeah, I'm clear, but it's still okay. waiting. And then, um, and then the fact that um, they're going to be like proposed on way under budget. They're needing more money as well. And about five million dollars additional or something like that. Over budget. Yes. Yeah. yeah because um, we had a real interesting time with getting stuff in the country and uh, waiting and and I and just um I know a lot of things get put off because of not having the supplies or the crews to actually do them because sure. of just situations of what we're looking at now right I know I don't know how long it took to get cameras <coughs> at the ESS to get that mounted because of just having the folks to be able to get that done so yes. I mean it's just it's just life it's just what happens we're seeing a lot of cost es yeah. escalations as the delays. Yeah, and I still was two and a half too. million addition to yeah. the school system, and you, you're just a, lot a of victim challenges. of it. Yeah. Yes. So that concludes the the needs that we have in your document. Our next steps, then, we're bringing this to you just for information today. We'd like to bring it back at your April seventeenth meeting. In your vision, she'd like to make. Let us know. Um, at that meeting, we'd be asking for your adoption of the capital improvement plan. And then there's the website um, that Commissioner Lashley has referenced as well that lists uh, all of the capital projects at all of the entities and status updates on those. You can also find an electronic version of this capital improvement plan uh, for those who don't have one and who would like that. Uh, can I just ask one question? Yes, please. I didn't want to interrupt you before. Yes. Um, on page 35, the elderly services building, $3 yes. million. Dollars, what is that? So that is the building that sits over there with Cooperative Extension and, and Environmental gotcha. Health. With the holes that Bill was talking about. Yes. Last time. So okay. this building is in disrepair. It's not really able to be used for any county services. It's not ADA accessible. There's some mold issues. So we would like to propose that we clean that building up so that we can use that for uh, some of our growing space challenges that we're facing. That's. Three million dollars will probably be more than what the whole place is worth. Just because we've of talked all about these. needing to demolish it if we're not going yeah. to do some of these needed repairs. But I do not have that funded within your general fund, okay. so we would like to move that into the debt model that we have and add that into a financing to take on some of those renovations because we don't okay. just don't have the capacity to fund that. And then under completed capital projects, the Petrie Building was a donation. So why is that added in to look like this is what all we've done? It, it lists the funding source there as a donation. Right. But it didn't cost any, anybody anything. That family donated that for, for donated it. Sure. Okay. Sure. It's not showing as a cost okay. to us. It was donated. Okay. We just have costs with utilities and maintenance okay. and whatnot. Okay. Just asking. Yeah. And so this um, court services administration in J.B. Allen, $67 million, yes. and then the civil court and county office renovation, yes. $4.8 million. Yes. Um, so those would be part of that uh, debt model mm -hmm. that we work on with Davenport. They're not included right. in a general fund appropriation and would need a vote of the board first in order to move forward on the timing of those. Okay. So that's sort of a separate... Uh, beast. If Any you idea will. what we've paid them for all these plans? Um, the CRA associates, in terms of the I mean, design work. Because they presented at one time it was a hundred million. Then there was some changes that sure. come back down. So I'm assuming what have we paid these folks? Do you know Sherry? These? I'm looking at Sherry to see if she has a number in mind. Throw a number out there. Throw it. I, um, I, I would say probably 60000 Okay. Not 600000 Thank no, you. No, okay. We're close to that. And, and just another one about the Board of Elections building. Uh -huh. um, is that about finished? Because I know last year, year before we talked about it, then we got it, and then we voted to buy it, then we voted to upgrade it for more than we bought it for. How close to being completed is that? The Board of Elections new building, is that the one that you're asking with? Yeah, mm -hmm. we're just starting the renovations on that and hope to have that done by September. Is that the right time frame I'm recalling? So that took a so while to underway. get started as well. underway. It did take okay. a while to get started, yes, okay. but the work is going now. Awesome. And hopefully by the elections, it would absolutely be finished before then. Awesome. 
Any other questions of the board? Quick question, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Um, Ms. Short, fiscal year 24 to 28. It, yes. I, know that's I feel like we've looked at, at the CIP plan a number of times over the years. Is there, yeah. a, is there a requirement that we approve it every so often? So it's a five-year plan, but it's funded annually okay. and is supposed to be reviewed annually and updated with needs. So yes, you would be looking at it at least once a year okay. uh, during the budget process, and right. you would be allocating the funding for the upcoming fiscal year. Okay, so this sort of a we're approving it based upon a look, looking forward over the next few years. Yep. But Ms. Uh, Commissioner Thompson brings up a good point in that the the sixty-seven million for the the court administration building and courthouse yes. expansion is in there. So, I mean, does, does approval of the capital plan that includes that number imply that we're no. agreeing on that number? No, it, it is just there, a placeholder okay. if it's not part of your general fund. So that's the only part that you're approving in these meetings is, is, is the general fund or the PAYGO projects. Okay. Those right. are funded annually through your general fund. Something like the courthouse project that has to be financed, that comes back as a separate discussion with the board would require a vote of the board on on the borrowings okay. for those pieces. Okay, I just didn't know if approving this was sort of Same. accelerating the process for making a decision. It, it is not, okay. and I'm sorry, that wasn't clear, no. Okay. Thank you. One more thing, this little picture right here, this back here, is that an extension to the jail? Can you tell me what page you're looking it's, at? Um, I'm sorry, 39, because it's uh -huh. like the yellow and on each yes. side of the existing courthouse and in so, the back. Yes, this is a previous sketch. I okay. think that was done early on. Mm -hmm. It's just as a, you know, idea. We've not committed to any plans for the courthouse. There's not been any uh, designs that the board has approved. So all of these are just very preliminary that we're using in here. And again, that will have to come back for this board to uh, approve not only a budget but a, a design. And we have so that'll be more expense to that will add come to out Mr. of Davenport. your debt model, yes, okay. with the Davenport folks, yes. Okay, I'm just looking at that and I think. Yeah, that's. Where a, are we going I for? think that must have been early on, probably mm -hmm. somewhere around that hundred million dollar project level. Okay. Um, based on what I'm seeing there. That's I just saw a yellow that I wasn't yes. sure of. It was because that piece on the western edge was is not in what's being considered right now at the 67. Yeah, we could update it, but then that will also probably be different than what you'll be v approving at the point that we bring this for approval. And we're so just sort of putting projects that like the this, burner. as big as they are, they are never really put up for a vote for the public when they're paying for it. The public I'm just asking. Right. I've so I've been asked that question by a lot no, of the, the board would approve of financing like this mm -hmm. if you wanted to do a general obligation bond, mm -hmm. which is the bond proceeds that you've taken on for the schools and wow. elements, community college. Those are voted by the public. That's a different type of financing. Um, and those would be voted. So but if it's you still the same pocketbook that's paying for it. The debt service, you mean? <coughs> All taxpayer this, money, yes. Yeah. Okay. Just, just a different uh, financing tool. It's like black and light black. It's still black. <laughs> I did my hair color one time and it went really bad. My husband was nice and said, it's light black. I said, no, it's not. It's really black. And it's, a, it's messed up. So I'm, I'm just curious. I see him out there nodding to the, his, his He response. don't need to say nothing. And so but anyway, I just see this and I just know the same pocketbook is paying for everything. And um, that's Sometimes true. we need to get their permission, not just vote it and tell them, good luck, good luck, because you're going to get to pay for so. Heidi, I have one question just yes, to sir. clarify what you were saying. Yes. Uh, as far as the county um, capital, yes. Uh, you said currently it's 300 k a year, and you yes. want to increase to 2.3, or is that 2.3? That's 2.3 per year. That's right. Okay. Right. Yeah, when we took an inventory of all the needs, it was around seven million. <laughs> so we are scaling back and trying to put this on a schedule that would allow us to start sure. taking care of our space. Okay. So you. that we're not coming to you with a $90,000 out of budget request to renovate a hole in a floor. Sure, thank you. Similar to the prioritization we're looking at from the schools. Yes. Yes, yeah, so we have already done that prioritization and, right. and are presenting that in this recommended CIP. But, but Steve brings up a good point. Um, related to the school system, um, 
you know, the, the funding sources that we have now were created a while ago for the, really for the bond projects, and those are, those are being completed. Um, but there are still needs, still needs in the school system, still needs in the county. Uh, but we've got new people in a lot of new roles since sure. we created the, um, the financing plan. Um, I think it would be really helpful to this board to have something like a CIP with a school system, with a five-year plan, 10-year plan, on, on what it is that they think they need with a rack and stack of um, the additional uh, projects that are not currently on the top 10. I think that would be helpful for us to, ha to have that, to put that in perspective as we look at our at the county's needs as well, uh, as we look at funding sources and as we look at projects. I think that okay. would be helpful. All right. I'm in total agree with Mr. Yeah, Turner. I think that would <laughs> that would be helpful. <laughs> I'm looking at the Yeah, we can work on that. <laughs> Duly noted, right? Yep. I just have to ask a question and it's probably not gonna sit well with people, but we are real concerned about how the school system spends their money and we should be. And and we are in that body. Who who holds us accountable like we're doing then? People outside. Voters and the citizens mm -hmm. of Alamance County. That's, that's what elections are for. Right. And if you don't do a good job, they send you home. Okay. I'd like and to just like they should do it. Can I finish? Well, my apologies. <laughs> you men just want to talk over me all the you time. You ask a question. Well, let me finish, <laughs> Bill. I don't interrupt you. And so I'm, I'm just asking this question because there's a lot of tension here and I'm feeling it. And I'm not going to go to what those tensions are because they're warranted. But at the same time, we, we can't put ourselves up on such pedestals that we can just tell everybody what to do with everything, but yet nobody seems to tell us. Like, we are looking at big spending here. We're just going for it, talking about what color drapes we're going to buy. And that's being funny, but it's not. And um, I just think I'm just big into accountability for all of us. Being elected does not give me a pass. It just doesn't. We work for everybody walking in this county. And that's for kids that go to school. That's for people here that's for everything and um, I just we just got to be real careful with getting territorial like we just have the right to tell everybody something when it's maybe it isn't our right and we can do it in a much better way and work together in a more collaborative way instead of um, I mean I've been on the school board for eight years and I've known how this board and that board automatically were pissed off at each other over nothing. It was just that way and it was a power thing. And we see, you see that in everything. You know, you see it in churches, you see it in everything. And if we start doing that, we won't get anywhere because everybody will put their claws in and they'll sink in and they'll go, I'm gonna do it my way. Well, right way, not my way. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not taking up for them, I'm not taking up for us. I'm just hoping that we will just just really want to work together. Sometimes that means we may be wrong, they may be wrong, and we gotta be big enough to admit that. Because I don't wanna waste money on anything. I don't want a kid to do without with anything. I don't want county to do without with anything, but we just, we just are partners. One election is not more important than the other when it comes to being leaders, and that's about working together to get accomplished things done that we wanna see. That, that's all, that's, that's all I'm saying. I'm not, I'm not defending anybody. I'm just really making sure that we're really working together for the best of, we always talk about these taxpayers, you know. Well, we're all taxpayers. It's I live all of here us. too. Yep. <laughs> Me too. So I just want us to be real smart with how we spend everybody else's money because it's one time deal, so to speak. Once it's gone, it's gone. Kind of like your groceries. <laughs> it's like renting your food nowadays. So. Anything else? Thank you. I think you have 6D as well, do you know? Um, yes, I will introduce that item. Um, it is an update or a summary of your uh, strategic planning session that we held during the board's retreat back in the end of January. So on January 30th, um, we met, we set some goals, and we wanted to just bring this summary back to you because it is going to serve as the the framework or the skeleton, if you will, for the recommended budget. Uh, so we are trying to make sure that we are presenting a budget that reflects the, go the goals and the priorities of the board. So we wanted to bring back this summary, get it back in front of you. Um, we owed you that from the retreat in January. So that's what we're doing uh, with this. And Brian Baker is gonna lead you through um, a, a short PowerPoint. You'll remember that he helped facilitate the goal setting uh, during the retreat. 
Good afternoon, commissioners. Good afternoon. Um, it is afternoon. I was <laughs> paying attention to the time. Uh, we remember when we were at the retreat, we talked about our uh, strategic plan. Strategic plan vision Alamance was adopted in 2018 as a five year plan. So it is time uh, to revisit that. It expires in 2023. Uh, the plan itself is. It's not that old, it's five years. We didn't feel the need to go back and do all the public input and you know the whole big process again. I think what we really need to do is just update, take a look at the main focuses of that plan and make sure that it's still on track for what we're trying to accomplish as a county. So the main objectives in the strategic plan, we have uh, named strategic plan pillars uh, for lack of a better name, but these are the five large scale focus areas that we as a county government are going to focus on in the coming years and we have made some tweaks to these so um, this is the same language that we discussed in the retreat nothing new here in large part they're very similar to the original strategic plan language uh, but just to run through them to protect the public health and safety of our residents to preserve our rural heritage and develop our urban core and that's a combination of two of the prior strategic pillars involving agriculture and um, smart development. Um, collaborate with our local education providers to support lifelong learning, provide accountable and efficient government services, and maintain the quality of life in our community by supporting our unique assets. So those are the five pillars. The pillars in themselves don't really do much. They're just a placeholder and a framework for us to think about what we're going to do within each one of these very broad areas uh, that we do as a county. So um, you'll remember that in each one of these pillars, we kind of listed all of the projects that were available to you, all the ideas that had been thrown out over the last year or two, and asked you to do some ranking, uh, asked you to indicate which one of these were most important to us and which one of these were our priorities. So as we go through each one of these pillars, these are the results from your votes, for lack of a better term, during the strategic planning retreat. So the public health and safety priority was first, um, and these are in order of how they were prioritized by the board at the retreat. Number one, of course, was fund a new courthouse to begin the Mebane EMS station. Um, we have phase one listed. Of course, we need to do the whole project, but from a one-year standpoint, that's, that's what we're gonna get done this year. Uh, explore rep recovery court models and funding sources, support the launch of the new diversion center, and design the new 911 Emergency Services Center. So um, again, there were some more ideas on that list of things within the public health and safety pillar. We can't do them all. Uh, so these were the top five, and we have made some cuts down at the bottom. If you're wondering, hey, where did that one item go? Well, didn't get many votes. That's where it went. Um, the second pillar, preserving our rural heritage and modernizing our urban core, your number one priority there was to attract new businesses uh, by improving the incentive process, um, second, to fund new infrastructure improvements, and third, to partner with the Alamance Chamber and municipalities to retain existing businesses. Um, on the third pillar, our education pillar, we asked you to do a little bit something different. Of course, as we've been discussing here, we don't necessarily decide what happens. What we don't have a control over every single project in detail the way we do with these other functions. So that kind of called for a little different model on planning. So what we asked you to do is to mark your interest on a continuum of what we as a county should be doing. The left side of this continuum uh, is we as a county should only fund capital expenses. That's all that's required. That's all we're gonna do. Uh, the right side of that continuum is that we should do pretty much anything that is necessary, including capital expenses, teacher supplements, whatever operating support is necessary. And if you can see, I hope you can read on the bottom of that continuum, we indicated where some of the requests that we're hearing from ABSS or from the community, where on that continuum these requests <laughs> might lie. We asked you to mark where you felt the board should be and where the county should be as a whole, and you were all pretty consistent right there in the middle that we need to maintain strong capital expenses, that we need to maintain competitive teacher supplements, um, and that needs to be our focus. Um, so that's the third pillar. Um, fourth, to accountable and efficient government services, you prioritized first, completing the salary study to ensure competitive employee salaries for all employees, and the second 
uh, piece there is pretty similar uh, to imp implement targeted compensation um, in accordance with that salary study when we get it. Um, third, to improve communications and public information. And fourth, to implement a fleet management program. And the final pillar was to maintain our quality of life by supporting our unique assets. Your number one priority there was to expand rural broadband. Um, continuing down to continue construction of trails on the county trail plan to strengthen youth athletics and to explore feasibility of a convention center. So that's a big list, uh, but those are the priorities that we heard from you with the retreat. Um, and that is what we're gonna be work working towards implementing in this next year. So the next steps for this plan and for these priorities um, are to use these decisions to guide our budget priorities. So you'll see in the capital plan that uh, Heidi brought today and in the manager recommended budget she'll make in a month or so, these priorities that you chose are going to be reflected in that funding. Um, and that has really helped us as staff to guide <coughs> what that budget looks like to know what your priorities were. Um, soon we will also be updating the actual strategic plan document um, and bringing that back to you for review. So we're not looking for action today. This is an informational, informational item um, and you'll have an opportunity to formally approve that strategic plan when we bring it back. Um, and the final step will be to take the budget, these budget priorities and to put them into the performance management measures that we uh, ask our staff to complete. That's how things actually get done when they get down to that level and we get, give them to staff and give that clear direction. Um, so that's an update on your planning session. There were a lot of dots involved. Appreciate your patience with the dots. Uh, it all leads us to a good place, even if the exercise itself feels a little silly, but this was the result, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Johnson, uh, I'm informed that you want to say something else. Is that correct? Yes, sir. I uh, went out in the hall and I talked with uh, Rudy and he's agreed uh, and graciously agreed not to do any shooting at the range until after lunch on Sunday and will accept whatever uh, ordinance that uh, you folks decide to pass. Thank you. Excellent. And we thank you. Are you going to negotiate the future so, uh, issues with you know, the courthouse and everything else? No, sir. <laughs> I wouldn't dare touch that. What, what, what <laughs> just going by there was, you know, if we're going to post whatever ordinance that you do approve. So rather, we, we, if we find that they're doing something, we will take them off the range. But like Terry said, that they won't come after us directly because we're not, we're trying to follow the law and we're able to show our machine guns, our suppressors, our short barrel, short barrel shotguns. Those are all legal for us to do there. Um, and we will stop shooting uh, from nine to 12 on Sundays, woke up at 12. And that should, as I understand Terry, we, Terry worked this out and I agree to it. If you guys all agree to it, I don't have a problem with that. And if I, I told him, you know, he was worried about the business entity. <clears throat> if he is doing everything in his possible, possible, because it says unlawfully for any person in law and willfully allow. He assured me there would be people on that range to, to make sure that no violations occurred. Now, we also thought they can be ricochets you know, off of metal targets and stuff. There's nothing he can do about that. But at least uh, I think he understands the seriousness of what we're y'all confronted with and what I'm confronted with. And uh, we shook hands on it. If he follows what he says he'll do, we're going to make it all right. If he don't, then we'll have to do what we have to do. Let me ask the county attorney, because this does not just apply to one range. No. Uh, the Sunday morning... Non-shooting. Uh, should that or should that not go in this proposal? Um, well, the proposal was not meant to address noise. We have a noise ordinance. I'm sorry, so I don't mean noise. <coughs> shooting in general uh, during church hours. I haven't really considered that issue specifically in terms of shooting on Sunday mornings. Uh, you might recall the state has recently changed some of the law related to hunting on Sundays. There are some situations now where hunting on Sunday mornings is allowed, even though it's generally prescribed. Um, we can certainly move to try to make changes to the new firearm ordinance that might be in line with that, um, if that's something the board would like to consider. 
maybe thinking out loud. That's a dangerous thing for anybody, particularly a lawyer, to do. <laughs> I'm taking notes, but, no problem. Yeah, but I'm thinking not restricted in our ordinance, but just have an agreement between Rad and the sheriff. Uh, and I don't even know that it has to be in writing. Wherever Terry says goes. He's the chief law enforcement of the county. So he makes all the decisions at that point. Well, I, I would certainly like to see something in writing. and, and I, I, I agree I, I, with that, and yeah. he does too. I, I'm happy to draft something and send it to the sheriff, and you guys can, can work through that. I'm happy to work okay. on That's that. That's fine. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're down to the county attorney's report. Um, the, the sheriff's been my chief negotiator today, so that's <laughs> thank you guys for your feedback, and I'll have something else to present at the next meeting. Uh, we don't pay him extra for that, is that correct? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Terry's shaking his head. <laughs> uh, okay. County manager? I have no report, thank you. Okay. Uh, commissioners? Just a quick, quick one, man. Just a quick one. Um, there's been some talk at our board and in the community recently about both a public defender's office which would be funded by the state and also a fifth district court judge um, that would that would help with the district court matters we're number one in the state in terms of workload of the four existing district court judges just an update that th the house starts the budget this year for the general assembly and that those line items are not included currently in the general assembly's budget um, that the House budget has to go over to the Senate. The Senate then approves. There's a conference afterwards. Um, I think we have a, a moment here where we have an opportunity, if this board is inclined to support either of those measures, to maybe um, influence how, how the Senate might might treat a request. Um, I, I think this is just me talking, and I haven't talked to anybody on the board about this, but I think a, a resolution from the board emphasizing the, the importance of both of those things would be a good idea and would suggest that we consider that for our next board meeting again. I'm not asking anybody to make a decision now, but I, I think something that says that, that that we would support it and would abide by our duties to provide facilities for those. Mm -hmm. I don't think that, I know this board has not made a decision about courthouse expansion. This board may not make a decision about courthouse expansion, but I, I don't think that necessarily saying we, we'd support facilities for those two additional items implies that we would have to have an expanded courthouse. Um, but I just think it's a good idea for us to consider and I would recommend it for the next meeting. Thank you. Mr. Carr. Well, I, I agree with what Mr. Turner just said. I think a, if we want to support it, a resolution to support it to our delegation might be a good idea, and I'd support that. Um, I know uh, I've heard a number of comments from the legal community in the county concerning possible need for public defenders and from some outside sources that are not involved in the legal community have also said that would probably be more productive for those individuals incarcerated and in, in, in expediting the process of getting them out of jail uh, either bonded out or um, uh, get their get us a, a fair and speedy trial which is one of the issues we've been dealing with as well um, so I'm inclined to agree with mr. Turner that's a good idea um, I've already made a comment about the uh, um, funding for the schools, and uh, I think we've already made it clear that the the ordinance that we have in front of us and the ordinance we're, we're thinking about and discussing with the county attorney is not designed to control noise. We can't make a we can't pass an ordinance in the county that con that controls the noise from a gun range, according to state statutes, as I've been instructed. So. Uh, and I, I, I applaud Mr. Cartasi. I've had, we spent a ton of time in the, at the primaries uh, talking about these issues, and I had a feeling he, if, if these, if these, uh, if we came up with a fair regulation, he would support it, and I think that's what he's trying to do today. So I think it will benefit him to be able to pass that along to his members. So I applaud him for that. Ms. Thompson. Um. You don't have anything, Bill? Okay, let's get to you. Well, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Um, I, I, I agree with Steve. I really want to thank, um, thank you, Rudy, for being the big person here 
in every kind of way. You really looked at, I mean, you just really worked with everybody, with collaboration and working together. And um, I really prayed about this yesterday because I had, I just had a feeling that there was going to be a lot of angry people, and I respect that. We are all something, but I just have a simple statement. Um, and, and I, you know, we ever think about what we're really willing to stand up for. And America's really facing some turbulent times, and Alamance County is too. And every day there is the latest violent act. And I promise you, today's violence can be mild compared to the next week's. When I worked at Crossroads Sexual Assault, I thought I had seen the worst sexual assault ever until the next one. And it's heartbreaking. And we have um, sadly witnessed yet another school shooting, this time in Tennessee. Three nine-year-old children and three adults about my age murdered, totally innocent, their lives taken by a demon. And Saturday morning I was watching the news and it stated that the governor of Tennessee was going to push for safety funding in all schools, not just public schools, but all schools, Christian, chart, everything. And I wonder how many children, how many adults on campuses have to lose their lives for us to truly understand what is really fueling the violence and the evils walking in our streets. That same mindset and evil heart is here. It just hasn't acted out yet. And that could be our reality one day. And are we ready? I've heard the complaints and concerns about the noise concerning Rad Gun Range, and I understand both sides. I've heard the noise concerns coming out of the rock quarry and snow camp with heavy traffic and blasting. I've heard the noise concerns from folks who live near a speedway or even right across the street. And we have listened to folks coming before us complaining about litter. Litter does not happen by itself, and I would think that we would know better about that by now. Obviously not. And I've been called about serious hoarding situations in people's yards with old cars, stacked up trash bags, old appliances. Lord have mercy, just name it. And this is all about being responsible and following the rules, but, but do we? Sometimes the very rules that come out of these kind of meetings, we need to make sure that we follow them and we endorse them. So let me ask this. Where are the people and where are the folks willing to come here and talk about all the people dying from fentanyl? And where are the folks, where are they willing and where are they at when they're not willing to come here and talk about DUI crashes that take innocent lives? And where are the folks willing to come here and talk about all the insanity that happens to our children? And where are all the folks willing to take a certain business of pornography and the parking lot is always full? I wonder how many heart attacks or divorces would happen if I went by there and took a picture of that parking lot and put it on my Facebook. You know, pornography thrives in the dark, like all evil. It's hidden in a room with a locked door, secluded on a cell phone. Shine a light on it and it's exposed. And it should be because it destroys everything it touches. And what about the homeless and the mistreatment of animals? I had to make an animal call to Scott the other week and the crime, outrageous taxi vows, on and on. And like I said, what are we willing to stand up for? So since Rudy fixed the problem, I'm gonna still read this. And I would like to suggest the folks at odds be willing to sit at the same table and be mature adults like we all are supposed to be. Leave your anger outside the door and talk about your way to a compromise, which you just did. You know, we can get so distracted that all we want to do is win, just win, no matter the outcome. You know, yesterday was Palm Sunday. A very long time ago, Passover was celebrated. Mm, I knew I'd do this and happening in the city. Millions of people were there in town. They loved Jesus. They laid their coats down. They laid their palm leaves down. They even called him the Son of God as he rode in on a donkey. Prophecy. But when they realized he was not the king that they wanted, who had come to destroy their enemies, they turned on him. We do that sometimes. Many times, you know, all we want to do is just get even. Well, in about 15 minutes, the same ones yelling that he was son of God were yelling crucify him. So we're no different sometimes. We want what we want, and if we don't get it, no matter right or wrong, we're willing to go to war over it. So all these people in here are good people. I know that without a doubt or you wouldn't be here. And I'm just very proud that this has come to some kind of compromising solution. And I would like to say we spread that for our board to other agencies that we're so blessed to lead over. And we work together because it's not about us. It's about the very people that we're honored to lead. So um, thank you. I appreciate, I appreciate your humbleness and I appreciate your willing to work together. That's the way it's always supposed to be. Mr. Weiss. Well, thank you, Chairman. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank Commissioner Carter for giving us some insight on what the last board was thinking when they instilled that $0.08 cents moniker. Uh, I think it's really important that everybody knows the intentions of the board who voted on that. I think that's extremely important. Um, 
just want to thank the presenters today had a, uh, for coming today, and I thank all the people who came out and spoke about the issues that they're so concerned about because that is what we are supposed to do as commissioners is to listen to our citizens and try to resolve the conflict and serve up a solution. And I promise you that's what we're going to do uh, on everything, all issues that come in front of us. We live in this county, too, and we want to make the best decision for all residents. Um, thank you. Well, I totally want to repeat what Mr. Lashley just said, that ABSS capital fund that was for the bond that was passed in 2018 uh, was for that bond payment. It was not, quote, school money. So those, those that are saying that we're taking money away from the school system, uh, I'm sorry, that's just not <coughs> correct. We're refunding or transferring mo the money that was for the bond to other projects. Uh, and I think that's just a, a misunderstanding. I don't think anybody's trying to mislead anybody, but I think there is a misunderstanding because of the name that you guys in 2019 gave that fund. Uh, SROs. Ms. Graves? Yes, Mr. I heard on the news, this was <laughs> Fox right. National News last week, that Alamance County, North Carolina, was the only school system in the country that had SROs in every single school. I think we can feel really good about that. <laughs> can feel really good about that from the school standpoint and from the county and from the Sheriff's Department. Uh, Terry Johnson was a major mover in having that happen. The work, the differences between the school board and the county commissioners, uh, I think, have tremendously improved since Ms. Graves, you and the new superintendent are now in place. And we have a uh, a meeting at least a minimum of monthly between the two chairs and the two, we'll call the superintendent or manager, <laughs> uh, the heads of the, the two entities. Uh, and I like the word entity, by the way. <laughs> oh, off topic. Uh, I just like the way we're talking. Uh, I do anticipate uh, you and I talking about the longer range plan that Mr. Turner talked about. And I look forward to that happening in the very, very near future. Um, last thing, the resolution that these two gentlemen are proposing, I absolutely agree with. Uh, I've talked to all three of our legislators, our two house reps and our, you know, our North Carolina Senator, and they are asking me, wait a minute, why should we spend our political, whatever you call it, uh, and grant these monies to Alamance County for an additional district attorney, which we're in dire need of, and for a public defender office, when you guys haven't even, you don't have anywhere to put that. Either of those, uh, the public defender's office, and or because you haven't moved forward on your courtroom expansion. I think at a minimum, a resolution, hopefully with all five of us as county commissioners, uh, showing that we are going to do this and do it in the near future doesn't mean that we have to fund it when we do the resolution. But it, I think we've got to show our legislators and the entire House and Senate with North Carolina that we're moving, we're trying to correct this issue, we're in desperate need for the, both of those uh, issues, and I think a resolution is the least that we can do to let the state know we're serious about it. We are number one as far as need for a fifth judge in the entire state. Um, our, the judge's caseload is much is higher than any other county in North Carolina. Uh, so we're in line for that new position, but we haven't made any or taken any efforts 
to actually prove to them that we're ready to move forward. Uh, same thing with the Public Defender's Office. Uh, Mr. Turner, you were on the uh, court appointed list for many, many years and did a wonderful job. But having said that, we've kind of outgrown that. Uh, and unfortunately, you, you retired. So, <laughs> uh, and I respect that. Thompson. What did I say? Turner. Oh, sorry, <laughs> you confused me when you Craig said that. Craig is over there looking like, no, no. Well, he, he was an ADA at one point as well. So what can I, and I was on the court appointed list for many times, uh, many, many years. Uh, but I think we need that public defender office. And I think we've got to, by our next county commissioner's meeting, move forward with a minimum of a resolution. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye and, aye. and leave. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Commissioner meetings typically occur on the first and third Monday of each month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. The first Monday meeting begins at 9.30 a.m. and the third Monday meeting begins at 6.30 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting will be broadcast on LocalGov TV. Please go to www.localgovtvnc.com for more information about their schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash Alamance County NC or by clicking the YouTube link on the county website. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of this meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about the commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the County Commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.